Coming up next on C-SPAN, an oversight hearing on the damage caused by the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska's Prince William Sound one year ago. Members of the House Interior Subcommittee on Water, Power, and Offshore Energy Resources heard from representatives of Exxon, the U.S. Coast Guard, and a representative of the Alaska Environmental Quality Department. Good morning. I'm uh, Congressman McDermott, and uh, Congressman Miller has uh, been called down to the White House to negotiate some uh, child care legislation. And uh, feeling that uh, those of you who have gathered, we ought to get the hearing underway, uh, George called and asked if I would uh, begin the hearing today, and he will be along uh, as soon as he gets an agreement with the President. <laughs> I, I hope he comes back even if he doesn't get an agreement. Uh, I would like to say uh, I'd like to commend the chairman for holding this hearing today. Uh, his leadership's been outstanding in this whole area. And I'm also very pleased that we're taking this time to step back and evaluate the events of the past <coughs> year. <clears throat> On a personal level, the Valdez spill has been a very difficult time for me. The events elicited from me a strong feeling of anger and grief, anger at the reality of the spill and grief at how helpless we were in preventing the damage that followed. My only hope is that from this mess, we can enact changes that will make these accidents less likely to happen and our responses more likely to succeed. I have two overriding impressions of this incident that I would like to share before we begin the hearing from the witnesses. First, I read this past weekend that Exxon spent $30 million to repair the gutted hull of the Exxon Valdez. Unbelievably, that repair did not include the fitting of the ship with a double hull. It is impossible to quantify the total damages resulting from this spill. The figure that we hear most often, but which we all understand is not inclusive, is $2 billion. The Coast Guard found that a double hull on the Exxon Valdez could have prevented up to 60 percent of the oil from spilling. What kind of arrogance does it take to send that ship back into Prince William Sound, <coughs> or any waters for that matter, without a double hull after the experiences of the past year? I also cannot erase from my mind the immense frustration of our cleanup efforts. In some instances, the tides and the waves soiled beaches the very day after crews had treated them. Or who could forget the sight of people on their hands and knees literally cleaning the beaches rock by rock with towels. It is clear to me that unless we keep the oil off the beaches, the combined resources of the most powerful country in the world are virtually helpless in responding to an oil spill. I am deeply interested in hearing the recommendations of the panel on this issue. And we will begin today with Congressman Tozan from Louisiana. Welcome, Billy. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Congressman McDermott, let me first thank you and uh, Congressman Miller for allowing me the courtesy of uh, testifying before your committee. The uh, Merchant Marine and Fisheries Subcommittee on the Coast Guard, which I chair, as you know, uh, because of your work uh, with us, has conducted uh, over 13 hearings uh, dealing with the Exxon Valdez spill and the issue of oil spill liability. We've heard from over 150 witnesses, and together with your committee's great work, uh, the body of evidence I think we've amassed uh, can serve, if we wish to, as a, an incredible source of information and knowledge to properly deal with these issues for the future. But uh, I'm here to complain today. There was a famous French author named Jean-Jacques Rousseau who wrote uh, a piece called J'accuse, which in English means I, I accuse. It was written uh, to accuse the government of France uh, for violating the civil rights of a single Frenchman, a guy named Dreyfus. This Dreyfus affair made international uh, history as well as uh, French history. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was telling his government, in effect, uh, you're wrong, and this one citizen that you've abused is one citizen too much. Well, Mr. Chairman, I accuse the administration this morning of an incredible act 
I think of indecency on this issue. We have already passed from the House an oil spill liability bill. It's in conference. We're working with the Senate to work out the details. But we have already put into effect, before the bill passes, the collection of five cent per barrel, which is now going into the Federal Treasury for the purposes for which this act was intended. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, not one dime of that five cents has been committed by this administration under laws that already authorize the administration to use that money for the purposes we intended when we struck out to set up for this nation a system of prevention against oil spills. Not one dime has been committed to allow the Coast Guard to staff one a billet, not to build one skimmer, not to set up one strike team, not to put in one vessel tra traffic system, the VTSs that are so critical to moving traffic around, not one dime committed to helping with the transport of oil vessels or setting up better aids to navigations to ensure that the 10,000 spills that have been documented would not continue to occur to spoil our beaches. Not only has the administration failed to commit one dime in fiscal year 90, but here's the tragedy, Mr. Chairman. The administration is in its budget planning to use all of the five cent oil spill collection monies in 1991 to hide the deficit. It's all marked as credits against the deficit. And I accuse the administration this morning of doing what the administration has done with Social Security, taking funds collected for one purpose and using it instead to hide the deficit. Now, that's a serious accusation, but check it out. OMB plans to mark all of the five cent collections for oil spill liability prevention and response through 1991 as marks against the deficit, not one dime going for the purposes we intended. We're a year after Exxon Valdez. We'll be two more years down the road, if the administration has its will, before we spend a nickel to begin this great effort to protect <coughs> our nation's coastlines. Now, I really don't expect the Russians are going to come invading us this year. And I don't expect the Chinese to come invading us. But we are being invaded by oil. We're being invaded by drugs. And the soldiers we put on the front line, the Coast Guard, uh, men and women, who number fewer than the police officers of New York City, who have 1,100 less personnel than they had 10 years ago, are being sent unarmed into the battle. And instead, we're using the money intended to put resources at the Coast Guard's disposal to hide the deficit. Yeah, that's a serious accusation, but it happens to be true. And I think, Mr. Chairman, it's time for your committee and mine to begin raising this issue on the floor and to raise it so loud and to do what Jean-Jacques Rousseau did in France, to raise the level of accusation so loud that something's done immediately about it. Yes, Alaska has done some good work. You've seen it, I've seen it. Alaska has prepared for escorts. Alaska has prepared for better response mechanisms, but we found out how, how inadequate those response mechanisms were with Exxon Valdez. All around America, those response mechanisms are still inadequate. There is no Alyeska, and the five cent we're collecting that ought to be going to doing this fine work is being diverted, just as surely as Social Security funds are being diverted in our budget. Now, we ought not stand for it. We ought to tell this nation's protectors of the coastline, our Coast Guard, that we're going to see to it that part of those five cent funds are used for the purposes intended. So that you and I don't have to face a day again as we did at Huntington Beach, when the best laid plans of mice and men unfunded were all for naught and beaches were again soiled. So we don't have to face a day again as we saw in New Jersey and New York, when response mechanisms again proved inadequate because we are not fully funded to deal with these kinds of situations. Will they occur? Yes. We are 50% dependent upon foreign oil today in America. Odds are, the predictions are, we'll be 65% dependent for foreign oil before the end of the century, probably by mid, by, before the end of this decade, rather, probably by mid-decade. Most 
if not all of that oil will come to us by tankers. More tankers, more foreign captains, more vessels not flying the American flag, not covered by the law we will pass, will be entering our ports and harbors. Foreign captains who, in some cases, don't speak our language, can't read our charts, and are unfamiliar with our coast. And if you think the record of spills in this country is bad now, I suspect it will not only continue but get worse unless we put in place all the preventive measures that you and I and others have been fighting so hard to obtain in our bill. And unless this administration begins using the funds we're now collecting for the purpose of staffing up the Coast Guard and its strike teams and for building skimmers and for putting in place vessel traffic systems that protect our nation's coastal harbors and rivers. Let me shock you. The two busiest ports in America, New York and New Orleans, no longer have vessel traffic systems. Those two ports not only carry oil, and I know we've been talking about oil, but those two ports are heavy with incredibly dangerous chemical transports, transports that if ruptured would not simply seep into the water, would en enter the air and expose millions of people to toxic and perhaps even fatal damage. And those two ports don't even have a vessel traffic system. The five cent collections were designed to provi provide for those vessel traffic systems and not one dime has been yet appropriated or committed for those purposes. Mr. Chairman, it's a shame. And I accuse this administration of violating not only the spirit but the intent of that five cent collection. And I think it's time for this committee and my committee on the Merchant Marine side to begin raising this issue on the House floor. I would urge you and urge Chairman Miller to join me in that effort. I brought it to the attention of the House leadership yesterday. They were equally appalled. And perhaps if we raise it to the high enough levels, we can turn that around this year and begin preparing for the rest of America some of the same kind of defensive systems that Alyeska is apparently now providing uh, for Alaska and Prince William Sound. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, uh, I hope that the conference committee will come out with the uh, oil liability legislation shortly so that the authorization to spend all that money is available. Uh, well, some of that's in that bill, the five cent fund. Let me point out, Mr. Chairman, that many of the things I talked about, many of the things I, I talked about this morning in terms of strike teams, in, in terms of uh, Coast Guard personnel, equipment, in terms of skinners are already authorized under law. Mm -hmm. The administration could be now doing it. The administration's not doing it. And what I'm suggesting to you is if we pass our oil spill liability bill and the President signs it today, it will be two money. years before a dime is spent under the administration plans, and that's unacceptable. I agree. We'll work with you. Other questions of Mr. Tozan? I neglected Mr. to introduce Mr. Thomas from Wyoming. If you want to make an opening statement or ask questions, you're certainly free. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really don't have an opening statement other than to say that I, too, am very much interested in the progress that has been made and to hear about what's been done in the last year. And I, and I agree with you, sir. Uh, these earmarked funds that are set aside for a certain purpose ought to be used for that purpose, and I agree with that. But may I ask you, and I'm not as familiar with the process, the Congress, I would guess, has some responsibility. That bill has been now in conference for some time, hasn't it? Don't, shouldn't we move off the dime and do something ourselves to push forward on this? Absolutely. And, and as I said, we ought to hurry that, that conference, and I think we are. We're all progressing on it well. There's great progress being made. But my point to you, Ms. Thomas, is if we finish it tonight, mm -hmm. and we're not likely to, mm -hmm. but if we did, according to the administration budget plans, OMB, not a dime will be spent for the purposes intended through the year 1991. That's unacceptable. You and I can do something about it in our budget process. I'm asking for your help. I see, and I think we should. What about uh, the budget for the Coast Guard? I recall some discussion about that. Don't it, here again, uh, and I'm, I, I don't disagree with you about the administration role, but what about our role? What did we do with the budget of the Coast Guard last year? Last year was the first year since I've been in Congress that we fun funded the Coast Guard according to the administration request, the first year. And we had to do it by going to the floor and for the first time in 14 years overturning the Appropriations Committee. And the reason we had to do it was because the administration continually asked for zero funds for transportation in the transportation budget for mass transit. 
and Coast Guard monies have to be shifted over in our process to cover needed transportation functions. I have urged the administration, I would appreciate your help in that regard too, when it sends a budget down to the Appropriations Committee on Transportation, not to zero out necessary mass transit funds. All that does is causes the Coast Guard budget to get slashed. We had to repair it on the House floor. But let me point out something to you. Over the last 10 years, the Coast Guard is one of the few federal agencies that has received less than inflation over the last 10 years. In effect, its budget has been reduced in real terms over the last 10 years. Its manpower has declined by 1,100 over the last 10 years. And its resources are getting pinched harder and harder as we give it more and more missions, particularly the war on drugs. As we increase its missions, and we're expanding it mightily in the oil, field area, in the oil spill area, as we increase its missions, we cut back its funds. We can't keep doing that if we're going to have a, a functional Coast Guard and if we're going to have a good oil spill response a mechanism. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gadenson has also arrived. Thank you. And uh, statement. let me uh, commend the committee uh, for the hearing. I've got a markup at Foreign Affairs, so I'm not going to be able to stay long. But I'd like to first uh, commend my colleague, Mr. Towson, for his efforts uh, here today and, uh, in general, his efforts in supporting the Coast Guard. Uh, I don't want to get into a battle over the entire budget process, uh, but what we face here is a, a function of the tax and spending policies instituted in the early 80s that uh, ended up uh, putting us in a position uh, where we've now got close to a $3 trillion deficit. And if my friend from Wyoming uh, wants to talk to the President, maybe instead of cutting capital gains for the wealthy folks in this country one more time, if we could get him uh, to keep those revenues in the budget and use them for the Coast Guard and other areas, it would make a major difference. Uh, I'm proud that not only do I have the Coast Guard Academy in my district, uh, but the R&D Center that was uh, so crucial in dealing with the spill uh, up in Alaska. And I just wondered what the gentleman, uh, Mr. Towson, has uh, in store for us from his committee as far as uh, any improvements in Coast Guard uh, facilities and funding uh, for this year. Because as he's uh, uh, appropriately pointed out, uh, at a time where we've squeezed the Coast Guard, uh, we haven't said to them, do less. Uh, we've turned around and told the Coast Guard we want them to do more. We've got more environmental watchdog operations for them, uh, more on drug interdiction uh, action that we expect of them, uh, not to mention the normal uh, everyday safety and rescue missions that they're involved in. Uh, so I wonder if there are other things coming down the pike where we can be helpful to this uh, s uh, branch of our service. Well, thank you, Mr. Gaines. And let me and also thank you for your incredibly uh, uh, strong and constant support for our efforts to try to do something about this awful situation I just described. Uh, th there is some good news. Uh, and let me give credit where credit is due. At least the administration recognized, as one of the lessons of Exxon Valdez, that our R&D was awful. We're, we're trying to deal with oil spills with 17th century technology with mops and rags. We're so far behind it's a shame. At least they recommended and we have provided in our recommendations for Coast Guard budget this year a five-fold increase in R&D. We're way behind, but we've got to catch up a lot. But again, that five-cent collection was designed to fund a lot of these R&D efforts. Now, where is that money going to come from if the administration gets away with its intent to use all that money against the deficit instead of spending it for its requested five-fold increase in R&D, money we cannot, I think, afford not to spend if we're going to have the kinds of new technologies available that are critically necessary to deal with spills like Valdez. The good news is there is a recommendation there. The bad news is the money is still being counted, like Social Security, against the deficit rather than being allocated for this purpose. One of the dangers, of, just and I'll end with this, the, the, the Valdez incident is that it was so large and um, so extensive that the many very serious spills that occur around the country uh, don't seem to get the attention they used to anymore. They just had one, I think, I forget, in the Fish Kill or something in New York. I, I don't think I have the name of the river uh, exactly accurate. But these are very serious uh, spills in areas of tremendous population density and rivers whose environmental uh, situation is already strained. And the response and effort uh, needed by the Coast Guard is ever growing. And uh, we do, as you said, need to get to, to this century's technology. Sam, right. the number of spills that are serious in nature, not just a little gallon spill or some pipeline leaking, 
The number of serious bills in America averages 1,800 a year. Serious bills. And as I pointed out, I think right before you got here, that number is likely not to go down but up as our oil dependence grows and as more and more foreign tankers come in with uh, ancient technologies and, and uh, captains who can't even read our charts or speak our language. Now, we've got some serious problems ahead of us. If we don't start investing now in the R&D and the strike teams and the vessel traffic systems and in the Coast Guard capacity to respond, shame on us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. DeFazio, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, commend the uh, gentleman for his leadership in this, uh, this area. Uh, and, uh, you know, just say that I'll do whatever I can. We recently had a report uh, in my region of the country up in the northwest from the uh, Coast Guard stating that uh, they have virtually no capability uh, of uh, doing any uh, prophylactic or cleanup work uh, on the Columbia River, the one of the last greatest uh, salmon uh, runs in the world uh, comes out of the uh, Columbia River, uh, in addition to all the other wonderful attributes in terms of the wetlands and that. And, and uh, it's just unbelievable that we can leave ourselves naked before such a threat. Uh, and uh, the presidents can uh, play such games with the budget that, uh, you know, we're, we're using it to create a little illusory deficit offset. Uh, uh, he's playing a, a very, very uh, chancy game of <coughs> poker here, hoping that we won't have a major spill in a sensitive area. I, I just remember, I believe it was Chairman Miller who said that, you know, if the Exxon Valdez spill had taken place in California, that uh, there would have been some oil company executives hanging from the yardarm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the American people are not going to put up with this. And, and, and they uh, shouldn't. And, and Chairman Miller and, and others were quite critical, if you recall, when, when the Huntington Beach incident happened, American trader, uh, with the fact that the predictions of response did not match the, the performance. Uh, but let me ask you, please, w when, you, when you get to these points, when you see the predictions not matching the performance, keep in mind part of that is our responsibility. If we don't wrestle the administration down to the ground and force them to join with us, and spending some of those five cent collections to build response teams and to give the Coast Guard its capacity. If we leave ourselves naked on the shoreline in response to this enemy, uh, to, our, to our environment, then we deserve the same kind of criticism we launch sometimes at the agencies that can't perform the function without our help. And all I'm asking is that we recognize that today and we force the administration to begin recognizing it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Campbell? No, no comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. thank you very much, sir, and uh, we'll continue working with you and others uh, who are interested in seeing that bill completed in conference until we have a very strong response mechanism. Thank Make you, Make sure there's double holes in it. There will at least be some form of uh, <laughs> secondary containment. That's the least. Can I make a point for you? Surely. We can make sure that mo almost 100 percent of the oil would not have come out of Exxon Valdez if we do better than double hull. Hmm. If we go to some system of secondary containment like hydrostatic balance, that's what the new science is telling us. I'm going to ask you to help me make sure that happens. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This, uh, we have a lot of people to hear from today, and uh, all of your statements, the next panel can come up to the table. Um, the, all the statements will be entered in full in the record, and um, I would hope that you will summarize uh, to whatever extent you can. Um, this panel was asked to uh, comment on three issues. Uh, the amount of oil remaining in the Alaska environment and future cleanup plans or options, uh, improvements made since March 24, 1989 regarding tanker operation and what remains to be done, and thirdly, whether the industry is now adequately prepared to respond and to clean up a uh, major oil spill. And uh, prior to beginning the testimony, uh, it's the practice of this subcommittee to swear all the witnesses uh, who appear before it at an investigative hearing. Do any of you have any objections to being sworn? If you'll all stand up, I'll swear you all together. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, you can sit down. In order to inform you 
or your, of your rights as a witness before the committee and the limitations of the authority of the subcommittee, the rules of the House of Representatives and the committee are on the table in front of you. Both sets of rules have previously been provided to you. You are advised of your right to counsel. The role of counsel would be to advise you of your constitutional rights. Do you desire to be represented by counsel, any of you? Okay, thank you. We'll begin in the order in which people were published. Uh, Admiral Spies, Sipes? Sipes, excuse me. Sorry. It's all right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today as we near the first anniversary of the nation's worst oil spill ever. I have with me today Captain David Zawadzki, the Chief of Staff to uh, Rear Admiral Shangalini, who, as you know, is the Federal On-Scene Coordinator for the Exxon Valdez cleanup. The Commandant, Admiral Yost, sends his regards from Valdez, where, as we speak, he and Admiral Changalini are reviewing the exact situation uh, on the scene. Also with me today is Captain Jack McCarty, the new Program Manager for the Vessel Traffic Service uh, Program in Coast Guard Headquarters. The Exxon Valdez tragedy has certainly had a profound effect on many Americans during the past year, evidence of which is best seen in our greater awareness of the hazards associated with transporting oil in the marine environment. It's also had a profound effect on the maritime nations of the world. Uh, some have told me privately, in fact, um, the spill could have been in their backyard. They're so concerned about it, it was if, as if it was in their own waters. I've just returned from a meeting of the Marine Environmental Protection Committee of the International Maritime Organization where we've taken up the work of a new international convention on oil pollution preparedness and response. Within our country, the greater awareness extends nationwide and reaches from Congress, whose deliberations on an oil spill legislation we're watching with great interest, all the way to officials and individual ports. One of those ports, of course, is Valdez. And I know that one of your primary areas of interest for today's hearing is the status of the cleanup effort that's been ongoing in Alaska for the last year. Since the cleanup activities were shifted to the winter operations last October, federal, state, and local authorities and Exxon personnel have closely monitored the situation. In particular, they've been watching the effect of winter weather on the cleanup. While the weather has had a favorable effect on high energy shorelines, it's hard to say at this point just how much oil remains along sheltered shorelines, which are still covered by as much as two feet of snow. Cleanup activities will start again in earnest in early April, when Coast Guard NOAA, the state of Alaska, and Exxon officials will conduct a joint survey of the shorelines. On the basis of that survey, and Exxon's general plan, which is now being reviewed by the Federal On-Scene Coordinator, Exxon will submit a specific work plan in late April. Weather permitting, actual cleanup operations will resume about the 1st of May. The Commandant will maintain his strong oversight role throughout this process, and the Coast Guard will continue to ensure <coughs> that the cleanup is completed as quickly as available technology permits. While the primary cause of the Valdez spill is apparently attributable to human error aboard the Exxon Valdez, we've looked carefully at the findings revealed during the post-casualty investigation. First, we have instituted improvements at the Vessel Traffic Service, or VTS. We added the three people to the VTS complement to provide an additional supervisory watch stander around the clock. We are also continuously plotting the progress of all tankers transiting the VTS Valdez coverage area. We are improving our foul weather surveillance capability by installing an all weather radar at the Potato Point site. We are also installing automatic plotting equipment to improve the efficiency of the VTS operation. Finally, the entire VTS microwave relay system is being replaced. Coast Guard is also undertaking an improvement 
to the short-range aids to navigation system in Prince William Sound. A major light will be erected on Bly Reef. Range aids to navigation system in Prince William Sound. A major light will be erected on Bly Reef in order to provide more redundancy to the system of visual warnings for the mariner. The petroleum industry has made strides in its ability to respond to spills in Prince William Sound. In the wake of the Valdez spill, the Alyeska terminal in Valdez increased the amount of response equipment uh, and, uh, on scene. Certainly all, currently all tank ships are escorted through Prince William Sound by a tug and one of four fully equipped response, uh, and one of four fully equipped response vessels. They've also purchased a large skimming vessel, numerous small skimmers, a lightering vessel, two storage barges, and over 23,000 feet of containment boom. 2,600 feet of fireproof boom is also on hand. Dispersant application equipment is on standby in Anchorage. All of this equipment has been ordered and most is already in place in Prince William Sound. The rest of the petroleum industry is beginning to show similar improvements. The American Petroleum Institute has conducted a critical review of industry's role in spill response. Their most significant recommendations address the need for additional industry capability, especially in the offshore areas. The Petroleum Industry Response Organization, known as PIRO, is currently being developed to meet that need. We look forward to working with PIRO to ensure that it has the necessary capacity for timely, effective response to spills. Industry has also recognized the need for <coughs> comprehensive contingency planning and spill response exercises. The entire spectrum of response organizations, including governmental, industry, equipment manufacturers, cleanup contractors, are displaying a renewed interest in spill prevention and response. New initiatives are underway and new equipment is being researched and, pro and procured. In closing, I see a national effort to incorporate the lessons learned from Exxon Valdez. Some particular items, such as Coast Guard, uh, revised Coast Guard contingency plans, have been demonstrated by more than adequate responses, I believe, to spills in New York, in Narragansett Bay, and off the California coast. The Coast Guard is installing a better equipment, instituting new procedures, and increasing research and development in marine environmental protection. More comprehensive proposals, such as double bottoms, double hulls, and nationwide vessel traffic service needs are being carefully studied. Others, such as building skimming capability into our new class of Coast Guard buoy tenders, are being considered also. We look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and the other members of Congress to make this national effort a truly effective one. Now, I have asked Captain Zawadzki, Mr. Chairman, if he would prepare about a five-minute briefing for the committee, subcommittee, on the, the actual status of the efforts in Alaska. He is down from Alaska for this hearing. And if you have no objection, sir, I would like him to, to, to go on. Uh, the ranking minority member, Mr. Young, has arrived. Mr. Young, do you have an uh, opening statement you want to make? Mr. Chairman, I have an opening statement. I will cut very short. I apologize for being late. There's a lot of other things going on also. And, and um, I, I, I'm glad to be here. Welcome to witnesses. I'd like to stress one thing, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Exxon Valdez was a tragedy. And I said a tragedy. And the first thing, uh, many people enduring tragedies, they, people wring their hands and fret and worry and conclude that the world is coming to an end and nothing's done constructively. The second thing is to roll up your sleeves and get to work with your hands and clean up the mess. When the tragedy struck a year ago in Washington and in the media, there was a lot of hand-wringing and rhetoric which accomplished nothing. I want to compliment the Coast Guard for getting involved quickly and from very adverse conditions, too. There was a little bit of hand-wringing in Alaska, too. But I'm proud to represent the state of Alaska where, except for a few exceptions, the overwhelming response was to roll up its sleeves and get to work. While some were posing for the cameras and stating the obvious, most Alaskans were doing what was needed to be done. When hatcheries were threatened, the response wasn't quick enough. Fishermen were there in their own boats with whatever work to save the resources, and they did so. 
When there was a need for boats, aircraft, equipment, and bodies, Alaskans responded quickly to that task. While some complained what not enough was being done, most Alaskans responded as they've done in the past, like 1964 mm -hmm. in the earthquake, show us what to do and we'll do it. It was cold, hard work and dangerous work and Alaskans did it and I'm proud of that. I have another observation for Alaskans here today. Don't rely on Washington to solve all the problems of Alaska. Since statehood, Washington has always extracted a price for even the most reasonable requests. Alaska makes good press in Washington and brings out the cameras like flies on cake. But the sound bites in the media shows won't solve the problems. I just saw the black tide. And even the extreme environmental says it's a piece of junk. We must do and must solve most of our problems ourselves with the help, yes, of the Coast Guard and those that are involved. Because we are also involved in the state of Alaska. Don't get me wrong, some things can be helped here in Washington. The provisions relating to Alaska I've gotten in the House Oil Spill Bill with the help of Billy Tozan, the Mercer Marine Committee, are good for Alaska and good for the nation, by the way. Many of the ports that are receiving oil, Mr. Chairman, and many of these people at this table will recognize this, were just as unprepared as those in Alaska. The oil spill that should have been passed but stopped in the Senate, stopped in the Senate for 12 years, this new oil spill will help solve most of the problems of Alaska and the other ports where we're now importing 58 percent of the oil into our shores today. But again, in Alaska, we can't rely on Washington to solve all our problems. Alaska, very easily, is an easy vote for most members of Congress. They want to lock up some land. They want to shut down the oil. They don't want to develop any oil. They want to cut us from uh, allowing us to have jobs available. Uh, you know, it's an easy vote for most of the, the Congress to vote against Alaska. And I, again, suggest to Alaskans, the governor, state legislative body, we can solve a lot of these problems ourselves. I would say, Mr. Chairman, I have heard people criticize the Coast Guard. I would suggest respectfully, if anybody should be criticized, it should be the Congress. We did not give the Coast Guard the authority in 1971 as we should have. And we have never funded them adequately. The Congress has not funded them adequately. This is just not an Alaskan problem. This is a national problem. As I stress again, we're importing 58 percent today of foreign oils onto our ports on foreign ships, not American ships. And they can walk away from those oil spills and cause just as much more damage as occurred in Alaska. So out of this dark cloud, there's some silver linings. It's awaken the people. Now, I have people that say we shouldn't develop any oil at all. But in the meantime, we're sending dollars abroad. We're bringing that oil into our shores without any ability to clean up or without any ability to reimburse those that are harmed. So, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to have these people before us today. And I can say one thing, and I probably should not say, but I'm going to say it. Any other oil company could have walked away from this bill. And Exxon's taken its lumps over this problem. They've been criticized thoroughly. In many cases, they have been very short in their efforts. But they have, in fact, spent $2 billion trying to rectify a tragedy. I think it's time that this Congress wake up, pass the legislation as necessary, give compliments where it's, it's granted, and make sure that we fund the federal agencies so they can do the job correctly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the safe transport of Alaskan oil is of vital importance to meeting this nation's energy needs. Currently, 25 percent of domestic oil production comes through the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. That oil must then be transported to the lower 48 by tanker vessels. So here we are one year after the Exxon Valdez accident to examine what has been done to improve transportation safety in Prince William Sound. We must also examine what remains to be done both to clean up the spill and to improve tanker safety generally. U.S. dependency on foreign oil now exceeds 50 percent of U.S. consumption. As that dependency increases, so will tanker traffic. As Congress attempts to finalize the oil spill legislation, we must look at improved tanker designs, such as double hulls, to ensure that there are no more oil spills. I am glad to see that the Exxon Corporation is following through on its commitment to return to Alaska to complete the cleanup. On behalf of the Republican members, I want to welcome witnesses here today, and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Captain? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, starting this Sunday, more than 150 people who make up the 20 uh, joint assessment teams will begin four days of training. The purpose of this training is to prepare them for this season's reassessment, which should start a week from today, weather permitting. Uh, these six-person teams will have representatives from the Federal On-Scene Coordinator, the State of Alaska, Land or Resource uh, Manager, uh, Exxon, and Science Specialists. 
when they get to the shoreline, I expect them to find the following conditions. There will be surface and subsurface oil, but it will be much less uh, than we saw last fall. Exposed shorelines will show a significant decrease from last fall's conditions. Sheltered shorelines uh, will also show some change, but less than that of the exposed areas. Subsurface oil will generally be more weathered except for buried localized hot spots, and there will be tar mats in some areas. The current assignments uh, for these teams is to walk uh, approximately 550 miles of shoreline in Prince William Sound and the Gulf of Alaska. The length of the shoreline to uh, be assessed is adjusted almost daily as more information is made available. Community among those that provide us with information on shorelines and item, items uh, of interest. The techniques planned for this year are similar to those that we used uh, last year with a few exceptions, which uh, I will reiterate. I do not expect <coughs> widespread use of uh, intrusive methods such as the massive hot water washing that we saw uh, last season. Limited small-scale use of intrusive methods in hot spots will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Such methods include hand water, uh, hand hot water wash, hand tilling, or minor soil removal. Tar mats, which were almost <coughs> non-existent last year, will have to be either broken up or removed as appropriate. Techniques will be selected that will minimize further, further disruption to the environment and its resources. The prime focus will be to enhance natural processes. I will be happy to respond to any questions. Thank okay, you. Thank you. We'll hold questions until we go through the whole panel, and then we'll come back. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Der Dietrich of the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is uh, Larry Dietrich. I'm the director of the Division of Environmental Quality for the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the committee today and thank you for your continuing interest in the, the policy questions raised by the Exxon Valdez oil spill disaster. I will address the issues raised by the subcommittee in the order presented in the Chairman's <laughs> March 12, 1990 letter to the Honorable Steve Cooper, Governor of the State of Alaska. The amount of oil remaining in the Alaskan environment. The spill, which occurred on March 24th, um, spilled approximately 257,000 <coughs> barrels or 10.8 million gallons of oil. On March 26, 1989, attempts to burn the oil resulted in removal of about 350 barrels. During the spill response, about 65,000 barrels of oil water emulsion were picked up and early estimates assumed that about 50 percent of this was oil. Emulsion, however, is turning out to have a higher percentage of water, and the current estimates are that between 14,000 and 20,000 barrels of oil will actually have been recovered. Assuming a midpoint of about 17,000 barrels um, have been recovered through the treatment process by separating out of the water. It is estimated that between 20 and 40 percent has evaporated. Based on an average of 30 percent, this would account for an additional 77,000 barrels. This would leave, uh, um, in terms of unrecovered crude oil in the environment of Prince William Sound in the Gulf of Alaska, approximately 162,000 barrels of oil that are unrecovered. With regard to how much shoreline remains oiled, uh, there was a comprehensive shoreline survey conducted uh, by the Department uh, from August 24th to November 20th, 1989, immediately after the Exxon uh, ceased treatment uh, last summer. Another comprehensive shoreline survey begins this month to determine the degree of change in the oil age since that fall survey. Analysis of the fall survey produced the following information. Approximately 117 miles of shoreline from Prince William Sound to Kodiak remained heavily to moderately oiled. Of this, about eight, 85 miles was in, the, was in exposed areas and 32 miles was in sheltered areas. 
Since the fall survey, additional surveys by teams spot checking the changes from fall through the course of this winter had, has resulted in additional reductions in those mileages. Spot checks of the shorelines this winter indicate that high energy areas such as beaches subject to heavy winter weather contain substantially less oil than low energy protected areas. However, subsurface oiling has not been as greatly affected by weathering in many instances. Many beaches are still heavily contaminated with oil below the surface. On some beaches, the oil has simply been buried by a layer of clean sediments. In places where surface coverage of oil has been reduced, heavier deposits of oil and tar can be found in niches between boulders and other sheltered areas. Sheens have also been observed um, by overflights throughout the winter. And on a recent unseasonably warm and sunny day in mid-March of this year, uh, observers reported extensive brown and gray sheens, much darker and more widespread than, than those that had occurred earlier during the winter. This indicates that warmer weather uh, may be expected to produce heavier releases of sheens uh, into the marine environment as summer approaches. A uh, number of the treatment options planned for this year have already um, uh, been mentioned. They do include manual pickup techniques, the use of snare booms and absorbents. Um, uh, another primary technique is, is break up and removal of tar mats. Uh, bioremediation has also been proposed as a, a cleanup option. Um, secondary techniques uh, proposed by Exxon include spot washing with hot water wands um, and some tilling. And indeed, the more intrusive techniques that have been proposed for this year include uh, removal of gravels uh, with cleaning of those gravels, a possible replacement. Improvements made since March 24th regarding tanker operations in Prince William Sound. Uh, a number of improvements have been made um, with regard to tanker operations in Prince William Sound. The Department of Environmental Conservation issued an emergency order on April 7th, 1989, requiring an immediate increase in response capability for, uh, for tankers entering and leaving Prince William Sound. The emergency order required among other things, the replacement of the complete core inventory of all terminal contingency plan equipment for the marine terminal. The required designation of round-the-clock oil spill response crews of a minimum of 12 plus crew supervisors to be immediately available and have as their sole re responsibility oil spill response. It also required booming of oil tankers upon arrival with hourly inspections for spills and verification that no oil exists in the boomed area prior to tanker deberthing. The order requires a company by two tugs of all outgoing tankers to Hinchinbrook entrance southeast of Seal Rocks. A further change was made to require onboard pilots and all outgoing tankers to a point south of Bly Reef. The enhanced full-time response capability uh, was required with best available equipment technology to respond to and arrive on scene within two hours to a 10 million gallon spill or a distressed tanker between Hinchinbrook entrance and Potato Point to include a minimum of 30,000 uh, feet of heavy duty deep skirted rough water sea going boom capable of withstanding performing in a three meter sea state. It also recovers, uh, requires recovery equipment capable of removing oil from the water of a rate not less than 10,000 barrels per hour with the pumping, transfer, and lightering equipment and storage capacity and transfer equipment adequate to receive, transfer, store, and store recovered oil at a rate of not less than the 10,000 barrel per hour uh, recovery rate that's required. The emergency order further provided that direct radio contacts be maintained with the bridge of each incoming and outgoing tanker, accompanying tugs and Alaska's oil spill response vessels while an incoming or outgoing tanker is located at any point between the terminal and seal rocks at Hinchinbrook entrance. It also requires immediate notification to the Alaska terminal by each tanker accompanying tugs and response vessels if an incident occurs or if there is any irregularity or indication of a problem which threatens or may threaten the tanker or its cargo or ballast water, including notification if the tanker leaves the Coast Guard designated traffic lanes. The department also requested a that a revised contingency plan 
be submitted. That plan has now um, uh, been submitted. We have received the outstanding sections of the revised contingency plan. The uh, Department is about midway in conducting public meetings on the application in 19 Alaskan communities. Uh, we are also coordinating an agency review of the contingency plan application and have contracted with outside expert consultants to do a technical review uh, of the revised oil discharge contingency plan application. The last question dealt with by the chairman dealt um, covered whether or not the industry was adequately prepared to respond to and clean up a major spill in Prince William Sound at this time. Alaska has stated that in most circumstances they will not be able to substantially contain and recover a catastrophic spill of 100,000 barrels or greater and that the only way to reduce risk of damage from a catastrophic spill is through prevention. Alaska's revised contingency plan application does reflect some new prevention measures, but it must be considered whether these are adequate or whether some new measures be employed, such as double hulls or double bottoms, tugs and escort vessels, or restricted operating conditions during weather conditions or sea states that will not allow containment or cleanup. The volume recovered in the Exxon Valdez oil spill um, will probably end up in the neighborhood of 5 to 10 percent. This is unacceptable to prevent major impacts. The Department has asked Alyessa to develop a response capability for a minimum 250,000 barrel spill. It may well be that a higher spill scenario is appropriate for design purposes. If the enhanced response capability now in place cannot contain and recover a substantially greater amount than 5 percent, then it cannot be assumed that the current capability is adequate. It is clear that the technology and threshold level of equipment and its availability needed to combat spills is not yet at a level to prevent major impacts. This problem is not unique to Prince William Sound or Alaska. The people of Alaska have indicated a willingness to incur the additional costs of prevention, preparedness and response. Alaska will continue efforts to protect its resources and shorelines. Congress should force prevention, require a new generation of technology and ensure that there is a substantial increase in response capability. Uh, concludes my remarks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. I would call the member's attention to the last page of uh, mm. Mr. Dietrich's testimony, which shows the amount of oil that's actually been recovered. I think it might be better if we uh, had Mr. Parker uh, speak at this point, and then we will go to uh, the people from Exxon. Mr. Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to address the subcommittee on the improvements that have been made in the past year and our recommendations. The Commission made uh, 59 recommendations in its final report, which you uh, have here before me and which I will not read to you and will not address all Thank 59 you very much. recommendations. <laughs> the uh, Improvements made in the past year, uh, Larry Dietrich has addressed them. I would point out that that system is the same system we had in place when Valdez was opened in July of 1977. That system was put in place by the state of Alaska in cooperation with the Coast Guard and the shippers and translate cooperation to mean two years of knockdown drag out meetings on how we were going to operate that system. And uh, it was a good system. What we have in place now is not as good as what we had in July 1977 in two aspects. The fleet <coughs> is 12 years older, with the exception of those few additions made to it since Valdez was opened. And you addressed to those in uh, your opening remarks that the Exxon uh, Valdez, of course, is only three years old. I also wrote Mr. Iarossi and asked him to consider double bottoming the Exxon Valdez, which would uh, cost in the neighborhood of uh, an extra seven to ten million dollars over that thirty million that was already spent. And it took about three, four months to get a reply from someone else at Exxon that they would uh, prefer to wait and see what was uh, going to happen in the future. Based on that, my uh, 
feeling is that uh, the best indication industry can give is this good intent is how fast it lays down new bottoms, but I'll return to that briefly later. Getting back to the uh, improvements, the other thing that's lacking is the port closure authority, a strong port closure authority. When we simulated Valdez in 1977, we established that when the winds were in excess of 40 knots in critical parts of the sound, it would not be possible for the tugs to respond and control the tankers in case of power failure, and uh, that the tankers themselves operating alone would have difficulty in those wind conditions. <coughs> and uh, we had a recent incident at Valdez, which I wrote Admiral Yost about, the copy is attached to our testimony, in which the tankers were operating in conditions in which their escort vessels could not operate, and that is a situation that has to be repaired immediately. Because if the tanker's out there in conditions where it most needs the escort vessels, and the escort vessels have to be held in port, why, uh, obviously, we uh, have no system at all. So those are the present uh, situation. Of our recommendations, we made them in three groups. And in the first group, things that could be done right now, two of those recommendations have been instituted in Prince William Sound and uh, only one in uh, Cook Inlet. The, uh, our second group of recommendations are things that need to be done very quickly and which are possible now. And the major one of those I would like to address is the vessel monitoring system. We have systems all over North America in which parcel services monitor their trucks all over the country. BLM monitors 2,500 aircraft in its system at the peak of the fire system all over the continent. And uh, the kind of systems we're talking about imposing in our report are very cheap to do, very quick to do, and give you absolute coverage of where the ship is at all times. We think in combination with existing radar that this would be one of the things that could be done most quickly to dramatically increase the safety of the system. You have a lot of different calibers of captains out there, which some of the committee members have already addressed. And having the cap cap capacity to, uh, in effect, look over their shoulder at all times is, we feel, dramatically important. As an illustration of that, the reference was made by Admiral Seitz to uh, the new Busby Light Reef. When the Exxon Valdez was on its unfortunate uh, leg directly on course for Bly Reef, when they went abeam Busby, Mr. Cousins, the third mate on duty, alone on the bridge, entered in the log, Busby Light starboard beam 2355 but Busby light is on the port side and it indicates I throw this in there to indicate the necessity for giving the bridge all the help it can in keeping track of where the ship is so as part of our vessel monitoring system we're saying let's get electronic displays that are the state of the art on the bridges to back up the radars to back up the present Loran C plotting that's required in regulations. Just another redundancy on there so that uh, third mates who are left alone on the bridge because of the, their captain is doing the wrong thing have all the help they uh, can in future situations because there will be future situations. When we set up Valdez the first time, we recognized human frailty, we thought, so we put all the redundancy in the system we could to ensure that when there was a screw up on the bridge that uh, it would uh, be backed up immediately by those redundancies in the system. Our third category is the ships themselves. The commission strongly supports the present house action on double bottoms and uh, double hulls and uh, feels that uh, because of the age of the present fleet the best commitment industry can make to safety is ensuring that that fleet replacement goes forward in a quick and orderly manner in the decade of the 90s. We have tankers out there are now operating that are 43 years old. 
we have a lot of tankers that are over 30 years old and we simply uh, feel that, uh, you know, industry showing a good faith, rapid response to the House action is the best signal they can uh, send in the future. Moving to uh, response, the one thing that we have a dialogue going with the industry now on response capability is whether response is going to be to the maximum feasible spill, as it is in some language, or to a worst case spill, which we feel is owed. It's the people of the coastlines of the coastal states that are at risk from oil spills, and it is the worst case spill that is going to most dramatically affect them. A worst case spill for Prince William Sound is 1,800,000 barrels. Industry said in its testimony in Juneau that they can only respond to 250,000 barrels at the most. <coughs> And after I heard that, I wrote the Alaska legislature my version of how a worst case spill could be handled in an economic manner. Responding to a worst case spill using the figures developed in our report, which have been substantiated by shipbuilders and others involved, would involve four tenths of one percent of the gross throughput of the Valdez terminal on an annual basis to maintain that kind of capability. And uh, I think that that is not asking too much. In our report, we give a strong role to the states, both in response and in prevention. Legislation has already been introduced in Juneau to give the Department of Environmental Conservation authority to go on to tankers and to inspect. We had this once before and it worked very well. The Alieska owners sued us immediately after the terminal was opened and in 1979 won their case and it was after 1979 that the very strong system that was in place up to that time collapsed almost completely over the next 10 years until only a few shreds of that system were still in place in, on March 23rd, 1989, when the Exxon Valdez sailed from Val sailed. So I think re-emphasizing the state role in this, that the states must do their part in combination with what Congress is hopefully going to pass out of the conference committee we're hoping that it is as strong a bill as I know many of you hope it is going to be, will uh, provide the necessary basis for a system which focuses primarily on prevention, but which has a response capability to respond to the truly catastrophic spills. We have one of those spills on an average once a year in the world. Some years we have three or four of them, then we go for a space of years where we have none and people forget they exist, but we can't afford to forget they exist anymore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now, Mr. Harrison. Mr. Chairman, members of the panel, I'm Mel Harrison, Executive Vice President of Exxon USA. With me are Don Carpenter, Alaska Operations Manager, who is responsible for logistics of the operations in Alaska, and Dr. Al Mackey, who is a senior environmental specialist who has been responsible for managing many of our environmental studies. The Exxon's complete statement has been filed for the record. With your permission here, I will briefly summarize the, high, the key points of the, in that statement. Thank you. Without objection, your whole statement will be in the record. Thank you, sir. Overall, there has been a tremendous improvement in the water and shoreline conditions in Prince William Sound and in the Gulf of Alaska. And much of the information which we include in our report is good news. However, there are some areas that need additional cleaning and Exxon will be performing that task this summer. The guidelines for planning this summer's cleanup program were submitted to the Coast Guard on March of 15th for approval. And after receiving the results, of a joint uh, shoreline survey, 
to be conducted by federal, state representatives and Exxon <coughs> and other scientists in April. A detailed summer work program will be prepared and also submitted to the Coast Guard for approval. The primary cleanup techniques which we would expect to use this summer include the manual techniques that others have spoken to here, uh, picking up tar balls, moose, and oily debris where it exists, and manually breaking up and removing tar mats where they exist, using booms and sorbents to uh, prevent the uh, oil from getting into the water, and bioremediation. Other, more intrusive techniques will be used in some very selected and special situations. The 1990 task will bear a few similarities to last year's effort since the mobile oil is gone, less oil remains overall, and the toxicity of the oil that does exist is decreasing. Most important, there are some biological communities there showing early repopulation and growth even on some of the oil shorelines. Thus, setbacks from a very intrusive technique or methods of cleaning could be very high. Our needs in terms of uh, resources this summer, in terms of people, equipment, and logistics will be only a fraction of last year's effort as we would now visualize it. In the area of restoration, repopulation and growth in uh, previously oiled areas is occurring. Resource recovery can be expected to, uh, to naturally recover rather rapidly. Nature, of course, has a tremendous facility to recover as seen in reviews of past spills. People sometimes forget that oil is a natural substance. In scientific terms, it is not highly toxic. It is biodegradable. It becomes less toxic as it weathers and is naturally consumed by bacteria which break it down into carbon dioxide and water. It's too early to finally assess the long-term resource damages and appropriate restoration steps needed to aid natural recovery. Both Exxon and the trustees have studies underway, but the results of these studies are not yet available. Early data are encouraging. Now, those resources that are most important to the Alaska economy, such as the fisheries, do not appear to have been damaged. Short-term effects were, of course, dealt with through our claims and payments this past year and are continuing at this time. Tourism, we understand, to have been at a good level last year and is expected to be virtually unaffected this year since the visible oil is largely gone Scenic beauty, of course, remains, and our level of activity will be less and less noticeable this year than last. Perhaps the most publicized resources affected by the spill were, were the birds and the sea otters. Recent surveys show a good diversity and significant numbers of wildlife have returned to the impacted area. Given the 10 million nesting seabirds, and 12,000 otters in the affected area and their natural recovery and resiliency, most of these species can be expected to recover rapidly. However, there are some resources which have been identified and will particularly need careful study. For example, we have identified some shellfish taken from mussel beds uh, inside a portion of the Windy Bay area which did have elevated hydrocarbon concentrations. And the eagles, which are fewer in number, and were perhaps more heavily impacted, will particularly need to be studied to see what restoration possibilities might be justified. There may be others. With respect to the process, Exxon believes that the uh, resource damage assessment process is most effective when the parties cooperatively work together to assess damage and restoration possibilities. Initially, Exxon anticipated such a cooperative process. It was willing and prepared to work with the trustees and the other agencies. 
The process has not worked as anticipated, and that has been to the detriment of the overall effort. The trustees and the agencies appear early on to have given priority to litigation and potential gains through litigation and have allowed their attorneys to seize much control over the process. The resulting breakdown in corporation, in our view, was unnecessary and premature. Unfortunately, the restoration interest and needs seem to have taken a back seat. Now, Exxon remains interested in working with the trustees if a satisfactory framework can be developed for a cooperative approach and the opportunity exists for mutually agreed solutions. Others have uh, commented on the preparedness, which was another subject that you raised. And uh, I'll briefly comment on those since it's been pretty well covered. Since the accident, a number of changes in spill prevention or response measures have been implemented. Spill prevention, of course, is the greatest and most important priority. However, the Prince William Sound response capabilities have also been upgraded, and in the unfortunate event of a spill, industry will be better prepared. Now, these prevention and response measures do not guarantee a spill will not occur, nor can industry guarantee that spilled oil will not reach the shoreline. It's reasonable to anticipate, with all the effort that we'll go into improving our capability, and research that some technical improvements can be expected, but major breakthroughs, given the inherent nature of the problem, are unlikely and should not be counted on in the very near future. This concludes my statement, and I'll be glad to respond to any questions. Thank you. I'd like to begin with a question for you, Mr. Harrison. I read with some dismay the article in the Anchorage Daily on the 27th of February, in which they suggest that their Alaska says there's no way it can contain an oil spill even half the size of March 24th of last year. And I, uh, do you think the contingency response system at Valdez is adequate to contain a response or a, a spill today? You use the term, we're better prepared. Uh, can you make a commitment to us that uh, the industry will control and clean up the next spill better than the last one? And I almost specifically, I would like to hear you say what you think will happen if there's another spill, how you will respond differently this time than you did last time. What is better prepared? <clears throat> that sounds like, you know, the Boy Scout manual, we're going to be prepared. I, but I'd like to know specifically what you expect would happen. That would be better than happened last time. Well, Congressman, uh, we've reviewed uh, some of the steps that have been taken to improve the response capability there. There is, of course, this dynamic positioning uh, vessel that's placed in the middle of Prince William Sound. It has substantial uh, fluid handling capacity. And notice I said fluid handling capacity, not oil spill pickup, because it's very difficult to estimate what percentage of that fluid might be oil. Nevertheless, the uh, vessel is there with, uh, I believe it's uh, 4,200 barrels per hour uh, fluid handling capacity. There is a significantly expanded capacity with a weir skimming device at, uh, at Valdez. And uh, so I would expect, and there's a great deal of additional equipment, including some uh, spray equipment for dispersants that have been added. The uh, dispersant inventories have been increased in Anchorage. And uh, with all these expanded... Uh, when you uh, say increased, are you talking... 10 barrels, 10 million barrels, 10,000 no, barrels? No, the, uh, the... How much dispersant is actually available? The dispersant inventories are, are still, with respect to those volumes you mentioned, relatively modest. There's about, I believe it's 65,000 barrels of dispersant uh, located in, uh, in Anchorage. But that is a very significant increase. In fact, I don't believe we had much uh, dispersant in Anchorage at all previously and it had to be flown up from other locations to get it uh, to Anchorage to where we could get it out to the, uh, to get it out to the uh, sound. And uh, so we've, we have expanded the uh, dispersant capacities. 
but uh, but also the, uh, the 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 biggest increase, of course, is in the mechanical systems where the uh, uh, the weir uh, skimming devices in Valdez is located, and where the dynamic uh, vessel is located uh, in the, in the middle of the sound, and of course. Uh, the escort vessel that uh, travels with each, uh, each vessel that uh, departs from Valdez has on it uh, significant skimming capacity and some boom to very initially respond. So I would expect, uh, I would expect uh, 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 an improved response with all of these in increased capabilities and uh, more closely located to the potential accident up and down the sound. As far as guarantees, uh, you ask, uh, you know, I spoke to that in my opening statement. Congressman, there are none. The, uh, the picking up of, um, of oil on a large body of water uh, that uh, uh, in rough, rough weather, if that were to occur, there's going to be some oil get on the shoreline if you have a major spill. And Alyeska, I think, was correct in that respect. If 257,000 barrels were spilled again. How much do you think you could pick up in 72 hours? Congressman, I, I'm uh, reluctant to give you a specific number. I don't think I can give you a, 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 a number. That's so dependent upon the ex existing conditions that exist at that particular time. Chairman? Yes. Uh, I'll, let, let's just refine the question and then say, given the rather ideal conditions that prevailed after this a particular spill in terms of wind and weather conditions, what, what would be the capability? I believe Alaska has made some statements to that effect, I believe, uh, and they are working with the state and making some estimates on that. I think some people have estimated, have put numbers like 35 percent of the fluid handled might be, uh, might be recovered, I, and uh, I don't know how reliable that number is. Do you, do you dispute the statement in the Anchorage Herald or the Anchorage Daily which says Alaska Pipeline Service says there is no way it can contain an oil spill even half the size of the March 24 tanker accident that dumped 11 million gallons of crude oil in Prince William Sound. I didn't say I disputed that, Congressman. If you, so you well, say there, you're say less than half prepared to deal with <clears throat> the same sort of thing happening again. I'm saying we are significantly better prepared, but I am telling you we cannot guarantee that in the case of a 250,000 barrel spill, there won't be some oil put on the shoreline, and we cannot guarantee that we can pick up that 250,000 barrels in 72 hours. There's a difference between being prepared and guaranteeing, and I think that they say they're not even prepared to, to even be able to do it, physically to do it. Uh, it seems to me that that's sort of saying, well, we're not going to do any better next time than we did the last time. I'd like to let the rest well, of the let's, panel. Let's comment on the uh, fluid handling capacity that was there. I believe uh, they've stated, uh, I believe they have the equipment there to handle uh, 10,000 barrels per hour of, uh, of fluids in the skimming capacity. Now, 10,000 barrels per hour will put you up into 240,000 barrels in a day. Now, that's, uh, that's a pretty significant uh, 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 spilling, spill uh, uh, pickup capacity, skimming capacity. Mm. Now. In 72 hours, you, 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 you've got the capacity to handle three times that much fluid. Now, what percent of that would be oil, and how much can we pick up, and how, what will we recover? Very dependent upon the conditions. And uh, so, uh, so, yes, there is a major volume that can, uh, can pick up a lot, of, a lot of fluids. So you're dealing here with, uh, in, in 72 hours, as you mentioned, in ideal conditions, over 700,000 barrels. A fluid could be handled. So, so there is a tremendous improvement in the uh, preparedness, both in the amount of equipment there, in the boom there, and in its location. And there have been about a hundred or so additional people that have added that are readily available for spill response, including those on the escort vessels, and including the uh, twelve people that are kept there as a, sort of a fire department type uh, group that's uh, at Valdez to respond. So from a people standpoint, there's been a significant improvement. I'd like to hear the other members of the panel comment on the capacity all day now. to deal with the same spill today as a year ago. How much better prepared? Mr. Parker? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Well, <clears throat> the Alaska capacity is very much as Mr. Harrison uh, defined it, so they could uh, 
you know, under a best case situation in uh, three days, come very close to getting 250,000 barrels of oil if you, <coughs> if you accept that they were going to get 35 percent of the oil in their total fluid recovery. And uh, proceeding uh, beyond that, uh, where I took it was uh, ARCO volunteered that they had 250,000 barrel response capability on the west coast that they would contribute. So I took them with their word on that, and that got us up to 500,000 barrels. Proceeding beyond that, you have to think in terms of skimmers of the size that ARCO has already uh, came out twice and uh, proposed that we should think about, which is taking and converting a 70,000 ton tanker to a skimmer which would have 25,000 barrels an hour plus capacity. So in 72 hours, that starts getting you up to 500, 600,000 gallon recovery. Beyond that, you have evaporation uh, taking care of 20 percent, so you're very close to a worst case right there. And assuming that the National Contingency Plan is going to beefed up, be beefed up, and the Navy, the Corps, and the Coast Guard are going to have a little more capability, you're starting to come up with something on the West Coast that uh, takes care of this. But of course, it's important to remember we're only talking about West Coast recovery capability right now. But uh, it, uh, my point I was trying to make, it can be done, but this is best case. Worst case, We've got to go out and uh, work on the technology. And some of the remarks that were made here earlier, I found very heartening about increasing the Coast Guard R&D budget uh, five times over because, of course, nobody's had any R&D budget. EPA's has been zero for four or five years now, and uh, Coast Guard and NOAA has been close to that. So uh, we found that getting into the gelling agents the coagulants, the, the stuff the Navy is using already in its test program was the most fruitful technological fix that we saw on the horizon right now for losing a tanker in bad weather where skimming would be impossible and uh, where your only other alternative to dispersants, which we been talking about for 20 years and really need to sit down at the table <laughs> and work out whether we're going to use them any longer or not, why uh, the only other alternative is burning. So, you know, in a worst case, we've just got a lot of work to do. Mr. Dieter? Yes, sir. Uh, I believe we would like to um, measure the adequacy question in terms of the amount of oil that's contained and recovered. Um, if you look at the, the numbers um, from last year and if it's reasonable to expect that approximately 5 to 10 percent of the oil from last year's event will ultimately uh, be recovered, uh, that leaves a tremendous uh, amount of oil still out there in the environment. Um, from this one event, approximately 160,000 barrels. Um, if you are unable to significantly reduce through containment and recovery uh, the amount of oil uh, that's recovered, then we don't believe you have much of a chance to diminish um, the impact from an event. Um, whether or not the enhanced response capability that's in place now will result in a containment and removal that's significantly higher than 5 or 10 percent that we're seeing from last year's event remains to be seen, and that's been a little bit elusive trying to get a, get a handle on that number. Um, another key factor in considering how much is enough is also your spill scenario. Um, our department is suggesting a minimum 250,000 barrel spill scenario for this event for Prince William Sound. Um, it may be that that needs to be adjusted upwards. Um, we're currently reviewing that uh, as part of the contingency plan uh, uh, review process right now. Uh, to have any um, ability to contain and clean up means the equipment has to be there, it has to be in place, and it has to be able to respond uh, rapidly. I think it has been demonstrated that it takes too long if you have to mobilize resources at least in Alaska's case from outside the state. If you do not have 
an adequate threshold level of equipment and resources available on scene, then the chances of containing and initiating that recovery before the spill spreads is, is, is unlikely. So we do not uh, believe yet that the response capability is, 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 is where it should be yet. We're still looking at that question. We're still trying to get a better handle on the strategies that Alyeska has proposed if indeed they will substantially increase that amount recovered um, in another spill scenario. I'd like to ask one follow-up question with the Coast Guard on this. Uh, Mr. Parker's testimony contains a memo uh, to the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation uh, describing a day when there were 50-foot waves uh, or 15-foot seas, 50-knot winds. Uh, Alaska couldn't go out uh, to escort. Uh, there was real question, uh, at least the, the conversation is that Mr. Williams was in agreement it would be prudent to hold the tanker in port until the weather conditions improved. He was unsure of his authority to do that and needed to do some checking to find the mechanism to take that stand. Uh, we're talking about the best case scenario here. Now let's go to the worst case in the middle of the winter with 50 knot winds and 15 foot seas. Um, that's not the worst case either. Um, do you have the possibility, the power to keep people in, in port? We, we absolutely have the authority to, to do that, yes sir, without a question. Why is that that they were unclear about it? And uh, uh, this is uh, dated 21390. I'm sorry, sir. I haven't seen the memo. I, I wouldn't mind seeing it. Uh, perhaps I can help there. Well, but we do have the authority. Let me just say, Mr. Thompson responded, Coast Guard is not in a position to enforce the state's emergency order and will await to hear back from ADEC concerning decision. In, in Alaska, in in Prince William Sound, relating to Alyeska and the movement of the, the so-called TAPS oil, uh, there is an anomaly in, in our national system uh, where some of the authority was given to the state to do certain things uh, and some of it was retained in the federal government. Uh, there has always been um, um, disagreements between the organizations. There are misunderstandings. I, I, I'd like to put it in the most benign sense because we don't dislike each other. Now, we get along very well, in fact. Uh, but it's not been clear in every instance just exactly who was going to take the action. Um, for example, the contingency plan at the Alyeska Terminal, I've said before in other hearings, is the responsibility of the state. That was given to the state under the Transatlantic Pipeline Act. And, and that is the single contingency plan in the entire United States that is the responsibility of a state. Now, that's just one example. Uh, but the Coast Guard does have the authority, uh, no matter where, to, to control traffic in certain, in certain circumstances like you've described. You're, uh, you're now giving us a guarantee that we will not have a hearing at some later point where we have the same kind of testimony we had last year that it was divided. We didn't know what we could do. We didn't know what we could do. Everybody was standing around on one foot and then the other waiting for the other guy to do something first. You're saying that that will not happen again in the future. I, I can see that that happens, yes, sir. I'm, not, I'm confident that I can, uh, I can guarantee that. So that there are clear lines of authority. I mean, the question that you can't, you can't listen to this testimony and know anything about weather in Alaska without asking yourself, if Exxon pulls out between September 15th and won't come back till May 1st to do cleanup, what happens if there's a spill in that period? I mean, I, how are we better prepared for a winter spill if we still have people in Alaska on the 13th of February saying they're not sure whether the Coast Guard can enforce the state's emergency order? It doesn't sound to me like we're, we've clarified the lines very much. Well, it certainly seems from the memo that you've described, I'd have to see it. I would like to see it to be able to take some action to, 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 uh, in I'm that sure area we'll, myself. We'll make one available to Good. you. But what happens in the wintertime if, if we have a spill? Are we prepared for a winter spill? Um, I, I would say, generally speaking, I'm going to, thank you. I'm going to, to answer that by saying th that first I would like to, to congratulate the state for having taken the action they took on an emergency basis to get Alyeska to improve their level of preparedness. They did a good job with that, I think. Um, 
they are prepared to deal with what we classify as a, a major spill, which is a spill greater than 100,000 barrels. But whether they could clean up the worst case, and scenario, worst case scenario in Alaska, I doubt. It would again take uh, us to mount a, a full effort, as we did uh, last year, uh, bringing equipment in from everywhere we can find it, bringing the Navy in, uh, bringing industry capability to bear as well. In the wintertime, to answer your exact question, uh, if, if you're in heavy weather and, and you've allowed traffic to, 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 uh, to transit the, the sound, it's going to be very, very difficult to deal with the spill. And a decision has to be made on the scene uh, whether or not to allow the vessels to transit. I, I would just like to comment that the, we have a letter here that the Oil Spill Commission sent to Admiral Yost dated 23 February, which asked the precise question that I'm now asking. As far as I know, there's been no response to that question, has there? The uh, response came in, Mr. Chairman, after uh, I finished writing the uh, testimony just before I left Anchorage, and uh, Admiral Yost had turned it over to the District Commandant, Admiral Changalini, for uh, action on this particular uh, memo, and that's where it sits right now. So as far as you're concerned, the matter is resolved? No, 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 as no far it's as not the, resolved. As it's far not as, resolved at no. all. It's just turned over to be oh. resolved. Yeah. Our recommendation on this is simply that the state, the Coast Guard, and uh, industry get together in an organization which we've termed Harbor Administrations for want of a better term and form, write them firm letters of cooperation in which they will establish the port closure rules firmly to avoid exactly the kind of situation which came up there. We made that recommendation before this situation came up, but it's exactly what we had in mind because we had the firm port closure rules once and they all dribbled away in the 80s because the Coast Guard's role in enforcing traffic is, from our review of the situation, simply not clear enough. It's not the kind of mandate that Congress has given FAA to control air traffic, and it doesn't have to be that firm. I accept a good deal of the arguments on the other side on that, but I, we feel it has to be firmer than it is now. So that uh, Coast Guard authority, in this case, is real authority, that if somebody's going to violate it, they have to do what a pilot has to do in the air, declare an emergency and saying, I'm going on my own, your instructions aren't or don't fit my case. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Young has a question. Uh, I'm going to ask the panel one question, but while I want to compliment you on your suggestions, uh, I think that, uh, I'll sit down when I get time. Uh, what you propose is correct. I, uh, I believe that prevention, that's the question of the panel. If we were to emphasize, and the, the question that the chairman has asked everybody about cleanup, if you had to spend the money and the time and the effort, should it be on cleanup? Or should it be on prevention? Hmm. That, may I start with that, sir? Yeah. That's an easy one. That's one of my favorite subjects. And don't take uh, too long because prevention uh, is, by any measure, the first level of defense. Uh, tankers don't run aground by themselves. People run tankers aground. In this instance, that's exactly what happened. Okay. Now, in that, that's I ask Walt. Will you go ahead? In that case. Um, do you believe now, and I asked my staff, if you wonder why I was standing up the question, during this, and the chairman asked the question, the debate about who was in charge kept hitting us. Was it the DEC? Um, was it the Coast Guard? Was it Alaska? And was it Exxon? Now, of those, during that action, who do you think was in charge? Night, uh, March 24th. Uh, in, in what respect? In the movement well, who, of vessels? No, 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 no. In the cleanup part of it. I think the responsibility is, is vested in the Coast Guard. And the difficulty in that instance is that the contingency plan uh, was given to the state to, to, to develop. Now, our role, and what you're asking, Walt, if I take correctly, is put the proper navigational aids in to give the authority to the Coast Guard and have the industry have the cleanup availability available at that time that, unfortunately, there was another accident. That's really what we're seeking right now. Equipment, the R&D, somebody in authority in conjunction with the state, industry, and the Coast Guard. I didn't see that. And you're absolutely right. Well, I was there when they pumped the first barrel of oil and we had the best technology in the world. And 10 years, 12 years later, 
I don't know where it went. Um, yes, and, and, I, and I've heard yeah. Admiral Yost talk about that. He was in the district at the time all that was developed. He remembers it very well, too. Okay, in no. this instance, uh, Congressman, I would like to suggest, uh, I apologize, I have seen this now that I see it in front of me. Now that you've uh, seen it a second time. Uh, yes, I've had sir. that feeling, too, yes, occasionally. Sir. <laughs> I have seen it. Uh, the format rings a bell. This, here what was happening was the state was asking us to enforce a state provision. And that's where Mr. Thompson had a cloudy view. Uh, where this needs to be resolved is, is out, at, out in the local area, the operational commander being responsible to sit down with the state and work these difficulties out. Okay, last thing, Mr. Chairman. Walt, you know the present bill that we're working on, the oil spill liability bill. In that bill, we have a lot of what the state has set forth already, you know, the escort vessel, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that uh, possibly we ought to add that big vessel at Arco's suggestion? Or is that something that should be done on a voluntary basis? No, I uh, think that uh, the issue of uh, the uh, skimmers uh, needs to uh, be forced, that kind of skimming capacity. I, uh, the time to uh, do it is now, Congressman Young, as uh, far as I'm concerned. Arco's made the suggestion, and I would uh, simply uh, talk at length to Jerry Asplund, who made the suggestion publicly, and uh, get their input. But uh, I would uh, support going ahead on that uh, right now. We've talked about it a long, long time. And that would be Ali Aska, though, would be in charge of it, not individual uh no, it company. would be an industry-sponsored uh, cleanup capability. Nothing in our suggest recommendations suggest that industry should be removed of the capability of providing the response to the risk they're creating. Anytime you put oil in tankers and goes to sea, you're automatically creating risk. So uh, the right. risk uh, creator bears the onus of uh, mitigating it. Okay, last question. Do you agree with the bill as it proposed that if, in fact, there is another spill of a magnitude of 100, you know, 100,000 barrels, et cetera, that there's only one chief, and that's the Coast Guard involved in the cleanup direction? We, uh, in our recommendations, say there have to be a government agency in charge. Coast Guard or state should move in immediately. We say the state should be in a position to back up the Coast Guard on this. And we, if we, the main thing, the only problem we have with uh, the way the uh, bill is phrased is that uh, we want it clear that when you talk about response, as Mr. Diestrich pointed out, you're talking about the capability of the local response organization to move right now. Yeah, I understand yeah. it, but what I don't want to go through again is this, well, we can't use dispersants, we can't burn, DEC won't let us do it, the Coast Guard doesn't know what to do, the Alaska doesn't know what to do. I want one, one agency be responsible in cooperation with the state because we're involved in this. We mm -hmm. own part of the oil, we're shipping the oil, we're receiving the money from the oil. But someone, you can't have two quarterbacks in the football field. There is no way does that work. You can't even have two quarterbacks in the same locker room. Well, you so, need to give, you know. Yeah, Congressman, you need to give a stronger mandate than is, was given to uh, EPA and the Coast Guard in the Clean Water Act on uh, that response, yes. and. Uh, that very definitely uh, does that. So uh, what we want to ensure is that the system is just as strong at the bottom as it is at the top. The state's putting together response districts right now, which is, I think, going to be a pattern that's going to be copied by other states. And it's the effectiveness of those response districts that's going to determine the effectiveness of uh, oil spill response. And if it winds up that we have a Coast Guard in command in each response district, I uh, think that will uh, be fine. But, you know, that's going to be an expensive uh, system because there's going to be a lot of response districts. So the bill is uh, going to be there, too. And uh, I don't want to make any uh, allusions. And it gets back to the point response is expensive. Prevention is so much cheaper than response. And what you are talking about is exactly what we have in mind through a vessel monitoring system that tracks the tankers at all times with the Coast Guard having the authority. So that if that tanker strays from the lanes, as they were doing throughout the 80s for reasons known only to the individual masters at the time, that he is called immediately and ex made to explain exactly why he is deviating. In fact, if you had the escort vessel with him and he deviated too far, you could call the escort vessel and tell him get on. Yeah. That's right. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I need to, I need to add a sentence to that. Um, I think there needs to be a single entity in charge. Uh, it's very, very difficult to run a spill, and I've run several of them myself, with a committee. It just doesn't work. There needs to be a single figurehead, a single on-scene coordinator. Uh, he can have all the advisors that are necessary, but he needs to be positioned so he can take action. I think the dispersant situation broke down in Alaska because the committee could never decide whether or not to use it. I think the man should have the authority to go use it and make the committee come forward with a veto or, or some disagreement in writing that they disagree. Otherwise, decisions never get made. Joe and Falaski yield for one moment on that. Sure. I, I've got an even more difficult problem where I come from. It's not just one state and uh, one set of state agencies and federal agencies. We could foreseeably have in Long Island Sound where 9 billion barrels of oil travel a year. Um, uh, we could have three states, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and uh, New York, each trying to solve the spill in uh, ways that might uh, work against one another. And I, I have you got a plan for Long Island Sound, and what do you do with three states all getting in on the solution? We, we, have, a, we have an on-scene coordinator for Long, for Long Island Sound <laughs> that in the coastal area is a Coast Guard officer. And, and does, that, does he have clear authority? over DEP in Connecticut, whatever the environmental agency is uh, in Rhode Island. I, and I believe York. he is, uh, according to the Clean Water Act, he is the single figure responsible for the cleanup. Uh, and do you have a monitoring system for ships in Long Island Sound? We don't have a radar system. No, the, the, um, the, the first stage of the VTS, I, I heard somebody mention VTS in New York earlier, the first stage of VTS in, in New York uh, is going in this summer. And it will eventually, as I understand it, a, a further generation Cover include the approaches. And, and, and just finally, are you happy with the, I mean, should we give that single administrator more power uh, over the three states, almost, it, it, or is there enough there now in that? Case? No, we're very, we, you know, you're suggesting that there's, that, that we have a, that the relationship with the states is not a good one. We have a good relationship no, no, I, I, with the yeah. states, and we work very well together. Uh, they ne generally will name an OSC and they come work with us. Okay, I don't think there's a problem with states, and frankly in Connecticut there's, a, as I think you know, a great relationship with the Coast Guard. What would concern me is that the solution for Rhode Island might cause damage in Connecticut or vice mm -hmm. versa or, mm -hmm. or New York so that the New York people come in, great respect and admiration for the Coast Guard. They want to keep the New York shore clean. Connecticut's fighting to keep its shore clean. Rhode Island's trying to do what's best for Rhode Island. and. Do you have enough authority to control these three states to do what's best for Long Island Sound? I, I believe so, and that and that situation arose exactly in the Philadelphia spill uh, last summer, uh, with the states the states that that OSC was working with, and and they worked all of those differences out. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Alaska uh, for the time. I'm again apologize to my colleagues for being at two different committees simultaneously. Congressman, yes. in the uh, we considered that situation and had a lot of dialogue with uh, the other states in pulling together our recommendations. And what we felt is that the states owe it to themselves to form uh, interstate compacts as necessary to coordinate both their prevention and response mechanisms. We feel this will make it much easier for the Coast Guard going in to have an existing structure in space or in place for coordinating with the states. That's a good point. There's no way in a big spill that the federal government um, should be expected to go out and, and handle the situation all by themselves. It requires the efforts of the, all the states and the industries involved uh, in a total effort. And the system, as far as I'm concerned, is not broken right now. Thank you. Mr. DeFazio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, Harrison, uh, what, what is the total cost thus far of the spill and cleanup efforts? <clears throat> it's uh, $2 billion is a good round number. $2 billion? A bit over $2 billion. Okay. Do, what, do you got any guesstimates on what it might run to? I mean, you're still going to have some more. No, I really don't. Could the, uh, the, as we mentioned previously, we're involved in the joint shoreline surveys. We don't mm -hmm. have a detailed uh, summer cleanup uh, plan yet uh, to put together, so it's difficult to make that kind of an estimate. Okay. Uh, my understanding is that there's been a request, uh, and this will come in later testimony, uh, Martin uh, Suberg, Associate Solicitor, 
uh, United States Department of the Interior in his testimony on page 5 uh, discusses a, a request, a $20 million request to Exxon Shipping to assist in uh, assessment activities. And to date, uh, he said Exxon has not replied. That's March 22nd. Uh, is, do you have any more current information on that? Have you responded? Will, you know, can you tell us if you will respond and if you will respond favorably to the <coughs> request of the Federal Government? <coughs> no, we have not responded. The, uh, there is a considerable history behind this, as you undoubtedly know. Uh, very early on, as I uh, mentioned previously in my testimony, we had attempted and planned to conduct a cooperative, uh, we, uh, we assumed it would be a cooperative uh, uh, resource damage assessment uh, effort. We had uh, uh, gotten together with the different agencies and talked protocol and talked where we would take samples and this kind of approach in a cooperative nature. We agreed to fund, uh, we had contributed $15 million to, to the uh, trustees for funding uh, studies. And, uh, and all of that was on the, on the assumption that it would be a cooperative effort. Now we have been uh, requested for an additional $20 million. Uh, it has been, uh, it is being considered, but I have to tell you that, uh, that under the memorandum of agreement, that we had signed under which we contributed to $15 million. There were provisions for us to uh, participate in the planning process. We don't feel like we have been given that opportunity. Um, the, uh, furthermore, the... Uh, I, think, I think that answers the question. Thanks, because I, I would do want to go on to other. Uh, so, uh, it, I mean, at this point, uh, we will not hold our breath waiting for the $20 million. Uh, Mr. Uh, back to Mr. Parker, then. You, you gave us a number, and I can't relate it to dollars. You said 0.004 percent of the oil that transits on an annual basis, that expenditure would uh, enable a capability for a worst-case scenario. Can yes, that uh, translates, uh, Mr. DeFazio, to uh, $58.5 million a year, $30 million uh, in uh, operating funds and $28.5 million to amortize over uh, 10 years a $285 million initial capital cost, most of which is for the big skimmer, the 70,000 ton uh, okay. skimmer. So. And so for $58.5 million a year, uh, we can have at least a feasible, I think you call it a feasible worst case uh, capability. Mm -hmm. Is that yes. that's correct? Those are my figures, and I was hoping they would generate some response from others on what their figures were. Right. Well, I'd, I'd be interested if anybody else has a, uh, has a figure on what it would take to uh, engender that sort of capability. Uh, if no one else does now, you can provide it for the record, uh, and uh, I'd invite future witnesses to address that question. I think it's very key. Uh, because for an expenditure joint among several operators uh, of, of that, you know, basically uh, compared to the cost of the spill, insignificant amount of money, uh, Exxon or uh, BP or someone else might not have to put out, shell out $2 billion in the future. So I'd, you know, I'd recommend that people take a, a closer look at the capability we're installing. The capability we're discussing, and anybody can address this, I'd I think I first asked Mr. Parker, when uh, we went up uh, for the hearings, uh, or perhaps the gentleman uh, more, uh, more directly, uh, Mr. Dietrich, uh, when we held the hearings in Alaska, we heard a lot about capacity. And uh, what happened as I sort of probed on the capacity that was available, we found out after a series of questions that what we were dealing with was nameplate capacity, and everybody knows that this machinery doesn't operate anywhere near its nameplate capacity. So even if we have the theoretical capacity that uh, we heard about earlier of 10,000 uh, 10, per hour, that's nameplate capacity. And actually, in reality, with things in the water and gum and gook and everything else that happens, I mean, when, when you get to actually operating it, you're not dealing with anything near that. So do we have any idea of what our, our real life capacity versus our nameplate capacity is at this point in time? The figures I used were 35 percent for best case oil versus uh, fluid recovery and uh, degenerating to uh, zero as the weather worsens and your skimming and booming capability becomes uh, less efficient. So uh, everything I said uh, about 
about worst case was uh, assuming weather of the quality that existed for 72 hours after uh, the accident. And uh, I think uh, I addressed the worst case spill in the information I've uh, mm -hmm. provided you, but uh, appreciate that. It can't be based on boom and skimmer technology. Right. You know. And we need to look at the real life situation. The, uh, do we have uh, your, you, uh, the idea that intrigues me of this uh, 70,000 uh, ton uh, tanker or a skimmer? Uh, given this enhanced nameplate capability for skimming and removal, do we have the lightering capability now to take care of that? Because that was a big problem when I was up there last time. Even if they could skim it, they couldn't figure out where to put it. Alyeska and his contingency plan has 460,000 uh, barrel lightering capability, uh, and uh, the uh, there's always empty tankers coming in, which uh, can uh, be uh, put into uh, service. So uh, the thing is to make sure that uh, there is a kind of cooperation that ensures that uh, the right tanker that's available is put into service as fast as possible, and not the most convenient one, which means our pre-planning has to be much more direct mm -hmm. than it was in the past, where people had options on what equipment they were going to commit or what equipment they were going to uh, use. Um, Admiral, uh, if I could ask, I, I'm, I still remain puzzled about the, the authority of the Coast Guard in these matters. Uh, what I'd like to know is, do you clearly have uh, the authority today, or do you need further authority, f either under administrative rule or from the Congress in forms of a statute, uh, to look at the weather and the conditions and just say, no ships are leaving port? Uh, yes, sir, we do. Okay. And it works in other places. Okay. It works very well. <laughs> okay, well then. Uh, we need hope to make it work better in Alaska. Right. Uh, because, uh, you know, there was some question about that last year, and I guess. I mean, what we heard in Alaska is there's tremendous pressure to keep going because the pipeline, Absolutely. I mean, the oil's on the way down, and uh, if we get uh, far enough behind, then we're going to have to slow down the pipeline. Not only that, but the refineries in California will soon start squealing. Right. So, I, you know, what I would hope is that, you know, you have that authority and you can use it absent uh, as much as is possible. Uh, you know, political uh, pressure because, uh, you know, that was a concern last year in terms of what we heard is that, you know, suddenly there were some very high and mighty folks uh, putting on pressure uh, when there, there were a couple of attempts uh, previously to uh, slow down traffic during periods of bad weather. And I, I just hope that if anything comes out of this whole uh, mess is that, you know, the administration and the Congress accept the fact that the Coast Guard has the authority and as the professionals on the spot, they should be allowed to use it and they shouldn't be second-guessed by anybody at the Department of Interior or Commerce or Transportation or anybody else high in the administration or anybody on the Hill that, you know, you use your, and, I, and I'd encourage you to do that and, you know, and come back to us if, if you're not being allowed to do that because it seems to me it's, that's absolutely key because you're the only one who doesn't have the pressure to get the oil out of the line in, a, in, in terms of making the decision. I mean, Alyeska and the individual oil companies and the port, uh, you know, have different worries, but not necessarily the worry that you have about that. Yes, sir, and I could cite, you're absolutely right on two counts, and I could cite your recent example in Drift, uh, Drift River facility in Cook Inlet recently. We stopped traffic uh, because of the volcano activity. Now, that lasted exactly one day because before, before pressure came for us to reopen and allow the vessels in. Yeah. Well, uh, we do have the authority, but it, we come under some, some interesting uh, uh, fire sometimes from quarters we don't expect. Well, written, written pressure or oral no, the, pressure in this, in, over in the this phone? instance, in this instance, the pipeline had oil in it, uh, the the wells and so forth. We had done a lot of work to reduce the amount of oil in the tanks. Uh, the facility was down so that if there was volcano activity that and the berms were wiped away, for example, uh, that it, that the situation would be minimized. But but the whole idea was just not to shut down the facility altogether. Uh, we stopped the vessel from coming in because there was a some rumbling and, uh, and, and had hopes to shut the facility in for the winter, but we weren't allowed to take that step. Well, I'd, uh, just one last question, Mr. Chairman. I realize I may have exceeded my time. Um, to uh, to uh, Mr. Harrison uh, again, um, this is uh, uh, an article from last Friday's uh, Boston Globe, 
And the, the headline is Exxon Shipping Fires 11 Senior Crew. And I won't read the whole text, but it uh, talks about a 40 percent cutback. Uh, most of the ship's officers uh, who asked not to be named said they were dismissed, at least in part because of their outspoken criticism of what they called unsafe operating policies, including heavy crew cutbacks and removal of radio officers. Uh, and the article goes on from there. I guess I, you know, my question is, uh, you know, what we've heard is you're going to do it better. And I don't believe everything I read in the press, uh, being someone who's subjected to it. But uh, this doesn't sound real positive uh, in terms of now if I found that those 11 were being dismissed for negligent activities or, you know, uh, involvement in, uh, in, in drug activities or, you know, alcohol consumption on the mm -hmm. job or that they were problem people, even though they were some of your most senior people, I'd feel better about it. But just when I read this article, I feel like uh, you're making some, uh, some cuts and, uh, that are stifling uh, perhaps some healthy uh, discussion among your masters about what can be done better and whether or not these cuts can be tolerated and we can operate the ship safely. Congressman, I'm not familiar with that particular article, so I can't uh, okay, address well, the details. We'll provide there. A, a copy. So but, uh, perhaps you could comment for the record then. Appreciate it. The, uh, however, uh, on the general point, uh, uh, <clears throat> we have gone down the number of uh, ocean going vessels that we're operating because of the smaller volumes of uh, barrel miles that we're shipping. And so, uh, so I believe last year or over the last recent past, we've gone down three to four ocean going uh, tankers. So we do have a, have had a surplus of people in various areas, and so we do get into some discussions about those those kinds of cutbacks. So, uh, uh, but I will uh, we will take a look at the look at the article. Thank you okay. very much. I, I will uh, provide a copy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's <clears throat> Mr. Smith. Um, Yes, sir. I, I just wonder if uh, somebody could comment uh, from Alaska. How many uh, tankers have uh, transited the Sound since we began operations in there? How many total operations have you had? It was uh, 8,600 uh, as of the time of Exxon uh, Valdez, and it's uh, running between eight and 900 uh, a year now, so uh, about another eight or nine hundred yeah. since then. Mm -hmm. How many spills have we had in that period of time? The uh, total number of spills, the biggest one uh, besides Exxon Valdez was Thompson Pass, which, which was at the dock, and uh, there were no uh, underway spills except for Exxon Valdez, it comes to my memory. Larry, do you, is there anything else? Everything else was at the dock, was it not? in the last year, Congressman? Well, no, I'm just talking about no. since we began. In other words, uh, you know, how safe an operation is this, uh, given uh, what we've seen over Pre the... Previous to the Exxon Valdez, uh, the largest one was 1,000 barrels at the facility. Uh, I can't give you the number. If you know, you'd like me to, I'll get it for of some you. kind, uh, I guess? Yes, it was an overspill. Yeah. What, um, uh, you know, I think uh, the uh, Mr. Parker's uh, comments, I believe it was, about uh, trying to track the, uh, uh, the machines and do a better job of keeping uh, track of exactly where they are is uh, the best preventative maintenance. Um, have you done charting in the, in the area in recent uh, years so that we really have good up-to-date charts in the area? Uh, uh, we'll have to wait until the NOAA folks come up, sir. That's their responsibility and I can't answer the question. But uh, basically, in other words, you're not concerned about the charts you have. You know where the rocks are and what's going on I, in that I part of the I believe that's correct, but, I, yeah, but okay. I'm, I'm, um, I'm, on, I've, I'm no, off I my turf. No, I won't say anything any different, <laughs> I'm sure. But in other words, it, and then we have good Loran C signals in there? I believe so. Okay. That's one of the mechanisms that we hope to use to attract the position of ships is a, a Loran transponder to receive so the, the signal in the VTS. The, the transponder would give you a lat long uh, geographic reference back to a control point to, yes. to give you a... Yes, sir. Okay. Um, is this basically the result of the uh, accident, or was this an ongoing effort before? To we try have done the work in this area since the accident, but the okay. work needed to be done. Yeah. You got good signals off that uh, Loran chain up there? Yes, sir, I think so. Throughout the, I mean, you don't have any areas where you're missing uh, signals. It, it is a C chain, and those are, uh -huh. those are usually the better ones. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it seems to me that if we can uh, use the Loran C uh, very effectively there and uh, set up a control point uh, that would have charge of it, uh, the one thing I'm concerned about that uh, in the testimony earlier about if the knots, uh, if the wind's above 40 knots, you have real difficulty with control of the ship no matter what, 
uh, would seem like uh, there are a number of days a year when you really shouldn't transit the, the sound then at all. I, it would I, I should think so, yes, sir. And I'm a fair weather sailor, so I wouldn't want to go on a lot of other days probably. Mm -hmm. But in any event, uh, uh, if we've had 8,600 uh, plus 8 or 900 more, it would be a fairly successful operation on, on a whole. And with uh, good uh, capability for knowing where the vessel was all the time, unless you had a power failure of some kind or an explosion or fire on the vessel, it would seem like you'd be able to control any, uh, any aberrations in the system so that we'd continue to have a really good safety record. Uh, and so while you have all these contingencies in position, uh, it would seem still that you'd be best protected by being sure that the ship never uh, does anything but bump up against the dock as it uh, finally comes to rest there. Um, so how close are you, I guess, to the monitoring system that will give you that kind of control over the traffic through the sound? We are, we are studying uh, the Prince William Sound, uh, Valdez, Nara, Valdez uh, system independently of the other systems. We have a, you may know, a, a, a port needs study underway, but we're looking at Valdez separately. Um, and we're looking at improved radar coverage, and we're also looking at other electronic systems that may, that may help. But you make me uneasy, Congressman, when you start talking about control. It's not our purpose to control, and I disagree with Mr. Parker on this, to control the ship, to tell the master in an FAA sort of way that he needs to turn right or he needs to turn left. Uh, we're a support mechanism, an advisory service to the master. Control re it belongs on the bridge of the ship and not in a room someplace on the beach. Yeah, well, Admiral, I, uh, having been a, a professional aviator at one point, I certainly agree that uh, the master is going to have to be in charge. But the master also, in the kind of traffic that we would have uh, in this day and age and in uh, the kind of situation we have, I think is going to have to have some overall guidance. Oh, I don't disagree with that. And so, um, you know, I think you're going to have to exercise more control as you go on. And I would suggest the Coast Guard's always been a little bit hesitant to ask for more money or more help or, or more whatever. I think with the uh, uh, role that you're playing in the drug uh, uh, war and in the uh, situation we have in the Sound, uh, you'd be well advised to get in the business of controlling uh, when these ships can depart and uh, where they can uh, actually operate in the sea lanes. It gives them some latitude and obviously the guy in the uh, blockhouse isn't going to control the throttle. But very clearly, I think uh, you're going to have to have more uh, authority, control, whatever you want to say, over uh, the de time of departure and, and the sequencing in and out of a, of a very um, insecure area, as, as we found out. So well, the uh, system in, in Valdez is one of the unique ones in that it is mandatory. Uh, it, it, that is to say, the ships entering the system are required to participate and they're required to pay attention. And yeah, well, how, how long would it take you to put in the Lorenz Sea Control System? I'm sorry, sir, I can't monitoring. answer the question. I'd be happy to get you an answer. Okay, I, I think we, if, if we could do one thing for you, get that done uh, in a couple, three months, uh, it doesn't seem to me like that would be too long to get that our, thing done. Our plans going. on that are moving ahead fairly, uh, fairly rapidly. Yeah, how long? Um, the man says about 18 months. Yeah, well, we, we ought to be able to shorten that up. You ought to really work at trying to get that done quicker. As, uh, I mean, this is something that... Uh, uh, none of us want to have to sit in here next year and talk to you again about this, uh, believe me. Let, let me see if I can provide you some more information. Okay. That will help Let's see how we that. can help. Yes, sir. I know the Laurent C. Uh, effort in aviation is being pushed, and uh, I'd certainly like to help it here, too. I think it's we'll uh, put the best way we can do it. Mr. Parker, have you got any other suggestions along these lines that we're going to try and push him with more money and, and uh, urge him on to greater uh, good? No, Congressman, you're uh, tracking right on uh, where we would like to go. The yeah. uh, Coast Guard and I have had this little difference for the last 20 years. They think I'm trying to push them into some kind of air traffic control, and I'm just trying to push them into a much sterner monitoring and uh, direction position because uh, nobody assumes that we're going to tell them uh, what, uh, how to steer the ship, but... Uh, they do need to do the things that you just defined in uh, your questions. And, uh, yeah, semantics can be difficult, but we really still need somebody that's uh, saying, uh, Mother, may I, and, and follows up. And I think uh, the automatic monitoring would have uh, apparently blocked this uh, uh, running ashore. Okay, well, I think maybe we can uh, do something about that, and I'll try and uh, get a letter off to you and see if we can't help in the whole process. Um, 
I'd like to go to Mr. Harrison for a minute. Uh, you know, Exxon has been battered around the head and shoulders, and we've done our share here in the committee. Uh, how much money have you spent so far, as nearly <clears throat> as you can it's tell? In the, it's, it's about $2 billion. About $2 billion. Um, how much uh, do you anticipate you'll have to spend this year? I can't give a very accurate yeah. estimate of that, uh, Congressman. It's this detailed shoreline surveys and the definition of what work will be required remains to be uh, be developed. I was curious about the, uh, I think it was the chairman's question about how uh, you would handle a winter spill. Basically, if I'm to remember correctly, you were told you couldn't come or couldn't stay in after 15th of September. That was the safety of, of the workers uh, uh, that was required by the Coast Guard to pull the people out. Is that uh, correct? I think that was... Everyone that was uh, working together there was mutual agreement, and uh, and the Coast Guard uh, certainly. Uh, uh, I mean that was an agreed upon thing. You didn't just arbitrarily walk didn't, away. We didn't, and uh, and I, I and from a walk away standpoint, we really didn't walk away. No, I understand we, that. We've continued through the winter there with continued uh, high level of activity, but not cleaning up on. When shore. will you uh, put your cleanup uh, crews back in? We expect around the first part of May. Depending on the weather and the winds. Uh, Depending on the weather and a, when we get the approval of the Coast Guard for the uh, cleanup plan that we will submit in late April, I yeah. would expect. Okay. Um, let's see, Mr. Dietrich, um, it is a little confusing, I guess. Uh, who, who do you think is in charge of the cleanup? Is the Coast Guard in charge of this, or is the Alyeska, or are you, or? I'm glad you asked because uh, I didn't get an opportunity to respond to Congressman Young's question on that. It's absolutely clear with us who's in charge. Um, there's a pre-established command structure <coughs> set out in the Clean Water Act that provides for the Coast Guard as a federal on-scene coordinator for marine spills in Alaska. It's precisely how it worked last year. Uh, Commander McCall was the on-scene coordinator for the federal government. Uh, our first field rep is our on-scene coordinator. It was immediately followed by our designated on-scene coordinator on day one. Communications with the Coast Guard were excellent. There was no breakdown in the command structure. We work with the Coast Guard on probably hundreds of spills over the years in Alaska. And this one worked as did uh, as we work with them in, in most of the other ones. Um, the regional response team was brought um, uh, into play. If, if there's a question here about the command structure and how it works, I think it pertains to the takeover question. I think that's the key thing that the committee should think about. What we had here was clearly, without question, again, a marine spill. Federal on scene coordinator was, was there in Valdez with our people. We immediately got together. When we couldn't talk on the phone, we simply walked over to their office or they walked over to our office. What we also had was a responsible party. One of the key decisions for either the federal on-scene coordinator or the state on-scene coordinator, one of the early on decisions that's critical that they have to make is whether or not they're going to take over the spill. This spill was unique in that we had a responsible party up front. When Exxon took over on day two, they accepted full responsibility. There was no question that they were mustering uh, all of their resources. Um, so there was no doubt about who was in charge. It was the federal on-scene coordinator and the responsible party had assumed responsibility and was taking all possible steps to take, uh, to uh, contain and clean up. Uh, under state law, in this kind of a situation, the state is allowed, um, although we are precluded from taking over cleanup, we are allowed to augment that cleanup um, if indeed the size of the spill is such that it exceeds the capabilities of the responsible party. In this particular case, we simply had a situation where the resources that were needed um, exceeded the combined resources of both the responsible party, the state, uh, the Coast Guard, um, our National Guard, um, and indeed uh, the Navy. The Pacific Strike Force, the National Response Team was brought in, and it was actually all of those resources that were brought to bear on that event. The decision making uh, in the early uh, days, day one, day two, day three on the dispersant was made in accordance with pre-established uh, procedures. There was no delay in those decisions coming out. There was legitimate concern about the effectiveness of dispersants. And the federal on-scene coordinator in that situation appropriately asked for a test uh, demonstration to see whether or not those dispersants were work. Those tests were conducted. Those tests did not work on the first three occasions. 
it's uh, still clear after the fact that the dispersants would not work to any appreciable extent on the spill as it occurred in those first three days. Um, beyond that, there clearly was not enough uh, dispersants available to, to do the job if indeed a wholesale application uh, had been initiated. I mean, even if they would not work now, and you know that, and yet we brought in 65,000 uh, barrels or whatever? Yeah, right. Well, they would, uh, the work, the, the conditions you need to make dispersant work, you do need the agitation. You do need that surface wave action to make those effective. I see. And it was the early days, uh, day one, day two, yeah. where it was flat calm that even though there was some limited action, it was not working uh, in the manner that it needs to work to effectively deal um, uh, with a spill. Okay. and disperse it. Uh, Congressman, I'd like yeah, to I'd, comment I'd wonder, on that. Uh, Mr. Harrison, if you'd want to uh, I'd make a comment on that. This dispersal issue and the differences of view on that is pretty well known, I think. And the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the judgment here by uh, Mr. Dietrich that uh, it would, did not work, it would not work in those first, first days, I think some remains to be resolved. Uh, this, uh, we feel that there was some effective uh, reaction of the dispersant even though it does obviously work much better under agitation. And, uh, but nevertheless, we felt it would have been, uh, would yeah, have been very helpful. Do you have comment about uh, the way the control uh, uh, worked or didn't work? Well, I've, uh, I uh, echo the opinion of the Admiral here, the importance of having a single voice, a single uh, commander, if you will, a single person in control is uh, absolutely critical. And, uh, and I do think that was a factor with so much discussion and so much pressure brought upon uh, the people in charge there that, uh, that did delay. And our, there were numerous committees and too many committee reviews, and we do need someone clearly in charge. We've got too many, too. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to ask uh, Admiral Yost a question. Um, 13, thank, uh, Admiral, promotion, Admiral Seitz, sir. excuse me. I'll take there. it. No, not yet, don't take it. <laughs> There uh, are 13 percent of the American ships in the Alaska trade, in the Alaska oil. 52 percent of the hull cracks are in that fleet. What are you doing about it? Um, we have been doing some follow-up studies with the, with, the, uh, with the operators and owners of the TAPS vessels. We've met with every one of them. Uh, and discussed in great detail the nature of the difficulty. There is a problem with the TAPS tankers uh, that relate to uh, the use of high tensile steel in their structure and some of the internals and the way they're put together. Um, uh, we feel a lot better about the situation since we've met with them all and reviewed each individual ship and talked with them about the programs they have in place to repair the vessels and to put them in an A number one condition. Uh, we, we've done that over, uh, over the last uh, three months since the first reports came out. Uh, and we believe that uh, uh, the majority of the structure of uh, failures which were occurring um, are only in f four classes of, of uh, vessels that involves maybe 16 of the total number of ships. The situation is a lot better than we first thought. Uh, we were a little alarmed initially. Well, let me follow that up with a question to Mr. Harris. The Herald Tribune uh, reports that uh, three Norwegian firms have just ordered 28 new tankers, all double hulled. Why does Exxon, Val Exxon Corporation oppose double hulls? Why did you, having spent $2 billion, why would you re retrofit a ship, or rebuild a ship essentially? and save yourself seven to ten million dollars in the face of what is obviously changing across the world tanker fleet. I mean, these Norwegians, Norwegians are not known for throwing <clears throat> their money around. Uh, they're very careful. I come from an area where there are lots of them, and they all go to sea, and they're very careful and very, very thoughtful people. Well, this question of double hulls has uh, long been debated wide variety of opinion. I'm not a marine uh, architect. I have read, I have uh, reviewed a number of discussions of, on this particular topic. It's a topic that uh, you, you described us as being opposed to. 
I, I, I beg to differ with you on that. That you, we're basically you're doing a ship right now. Well, let me come to that if just a moment, if you will, please, sir. Uh, we have uh, strongly uh, taken a position here that that the Academy of Sciences study that they are uh, they have uh, been requested to do by the Coast Guard, and I understand will complete uh, sometime later this year. We've supported that study. We look forward to seeing the results of that study because this is an issue that's been uh, heavily debated with differing views. The, uh, the correct answer on that, from my, my understanding, has never been clearly uh, decided. And in fact, I guess in 1978, that was an issue uh, uh, widely developed and, uh, and there was decision was not made to go to double hulls at the time. And, uh, and in this particular case, we're dealing with a vessel not designed for double hulls, and uh, so it was not a vessel that could be uh, readily modified. I can't support this. I don't have the seven million dollars. I can neither dispute nor uh, nor uh, support that number. I don't know the accuracy of that that particular number, but the vessel was not 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 didn't have the structural integrity to uh, to take a double hull design. But the fundamentals were basically is that we feel that we need a careful, full, with today's technology, re-review of that issue, and that the National Academy of Sciences will give us an excellent review, and we look forward to seeing those results. So you're satisfied that your decision, that the Norwegians, you think they're leading the way? Well, I don't, I don't know what the basis of their decision is or what kind of vessels that they're, put, they're building with that uh, double hull. But uh, again, you know, my basic feeling is that we need the National Academy of Sciences study. <clears throat> That's been requested. And, uh, and, and those are the scientists. Those are the experts. The they're the people to give us some, uh, some guidance on this. <clears throat> the 81 study was not sufficient for your company's view and I you know I, it's hard to know when you came in and lobbied against it you lobbied first you went to court and said that it had to be a decision made by the by the federal government and then you come in and lobby all the oil industry does it's a little bit hard to uh, believe that another study is going to convince you I have a feeling that if it's not done by legislative action uh, it will never be done voluntarily That's, but don't we, don't we need the, the experts advice um, well, I, mean, I come from a profession where there are lots of experts, and sometimes some of the experts are one way and some are the other way, and uh, ultimately we had another big spill, and I think we're just waiting for another one. Mr. DeFazio? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Parker? I, 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 Congressman, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, would reiterate that uh, we strongly supported the House position on this. This is the uh, third time up the hill for me on this issue, as it is for a good many of us here. And uh, there is uh, nothing new going to come out of the National Academy that was not available to the House when it made its uh, decisions uh, for its present language in the bill. And uh, the, uh, if we applied the same thing in your home state, and Boeing had made its decision on the uh, 7 4 whether to go for the wide body on the 747 in the same manner that the double hull decision has been made by the maritime industry, why we'd still be flying in 707s back and forth. So, uh, you know, somewhere along the line, decisions have to be made. And if the experts won't make them, then legislators will. That is the way it happens. The Admiral? nature of the National Academy study, first, Congressman. Uh, they are looking for us at alternatives to double bottoms and double hulls. That is to say, they're looking, as Congressman Tozan mentioned this morning, the hydrostatic method. They're looking at a vacuum method. They're looking at other construction arrangements that will help reduce the amount of, of oil lost in a pollution incident. Um, those are all good techniques. There are, there are few people that would, that would say that double bottoms or double hulls will not reduce pollution, because they will. Uh, what troubles me is the number of people that think that double hulls are the total, double, skin, double bottoms are the total answer to the problem, because they are not. Uh, double bottoms typically will protect a ship from a grounding. 
Uh, le recently, that seems to be prevalent in the United States, but that not worldwide in our figures over the last 10 years. In fact, collisions have been more prevalent than groundings worldwide by, by a factor of two. And, and double bottoms do not protect you from collisions. Now, here you have a ship, for example, the Exxon Valdez that leaves Alaska, uh, where grounding is a problem, and it goes to Los Angeles, where collision is a problem. A double bottom on that ship is not going to be the total answer to the question. So we may be back here another day arguing for yet another technique. And those are the techniques that I hope the National Academy of Science will provide to us. Yes. Uh, and the other point is on retrofitting. I did want to mention retro. That makes me very, very nervous uh, because, uh, because we have done some work on retrofitting. And while you're solving a pollution problem, you're creating a safety problem. We don't know how those ships not designed, as Mr. Harrison says, for double bottoms initially are going to act in a seaway. Uh, the heaviest seas over, over a year are in the Alaska to the west coast of the United States trade. Uh, we're, we're uneasy about those ships, how they would operate the Exxon Valdez with a double bottom. So are we in Washington. Most owners that talk about retrofit, if they're forced into that, are talking about building a whole new forebody, which essentially is a new ship. I understand. Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Chairman I've, I've got to say that uh, I've sat and uh, listened carefully and, and patiently, and I'm concerned that uh, we haven't come too far since last year in, in terms of the, the problems I'm hearing. Uh, Admiral, let me just ask a, a question. Um, what uh, the uh, shutdown that you uh, requested uh, because of volcanic activity, uh, wh what did that affect exactly? I'm sorry, I'm fumbling here. It was the Drift River facility in Cook Inlet. Okay, and that is a, uh, a pipeline? Or? It, it is. A, the wells are producing uh, further north, and there's a pipeline down into Cook Inlet mm -hmm. where the ships come into a terminal. And who, who operates that? facility, um, do you know, or, or what, who's I, I do know. Somewhere here I have okay. a piece of paper well, on it. Perhaps Mr. Harrison knows. Do you not know? Us. Okay, it's not <laughs> you. It's primarily uh, unit call oil. Uh -huh. It's Cook Inlet Pipeline Company. Okay. So I, I'm, uh, I guess I'm wondering who, uh, obviously, uh, the, whoever in the administration pressured the Coast Guard to lift the, uh, uh, lift the order to uh, close down the line and keep the ships in port uh, was pressured by Unical. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have them here to ask. I guess I'd ask uh, if uh, Mr. Harrison would tell us that uh, they will never, ever in the future, attempt to uh, uh, go against the best judgment of the Coast Guard when they want to keep ships in port and close down the line. Will you accept their judgment without recourse to uh, contacting high administration officials? Uh, I mean, are, are we going to make some progress here or not? Because the point is, you know, We've heard we've got nameplate capability now that won't do the job. We've heard uh, that, uh, you know, the monitoring uh, is not yet in place. Uh, we're hearing that the, uh, you know, that the Coast Guard really can't control things because the administration is going to uh, jump on them when they try and use their best judgment and tell people to stay in port. We're hearing that you're cutting back on your crews and your ships. Uh, and yet we're not spending this $58 million that w where we could have worst case capability. It sounds like you're still saving pennies and you just spent $2 billion. And the point is, why not, you know, why not let up a little bit? Don't you think your stockholders would like it if you, if you said, we're going to operate the safest tanker fleet in the world and there will never be another $2 billion loss, but it's going to cost a little more. And I tell you, there are going to be times when we're going to have to slow down the shipments. It's going to slow down the refineries. It's going to cut into the profits. I don't see any willingness to cut back on profits here. And, and I just think that we're headed toward another disaster. I mean, just, just give me, I mean, could you, could you just say, Whoever uh, the uh, Coast Guard designates to, uh, with authority over the Valdez uh, facility, when they say it's unsafe for ships to sail, that Exxon, for one, will stand up and say, we agree with the Coast Guard? Well, uh, you covered a lot of ground there. The, <laughs> the, uh, the manning levels uh, <clears throat> uh, basically are in line, I think, with what the industry standards are, that our manning levels are not that different from most others. That is to say that we have reduced some manning levels, particularly in those areas, as the technology permitted for us to reduce uh, 
people in certain areas of the activity. Now, generally, that did not involve the people uh, on the bridge. And, this and was no in other one, areas. No one in, in working for your shipping company, none of the crew have objected and said that they're tired, they're overworked, they're working too long shifts, they're working too many shifts, they're turning around too quickly. No one has made a statement to that extent. I wouldn't say no okay. one has so, so we do have a, a problem. Uh, again, to make the FAA analogy, where we don't apparently have rules saying you've got to get so much layover time or you've got to get so much time off, uh, you know, per per day or per week. Uh, those are up to the discretion of the company. There are some rules in that regard, and uh, so. Uh, so you're meeting the minimums, whatever they are. We're meeting the meeting the regulations. The minimums, okay. and I'm not How saying the minimums. But, but on the total safety record also, Exxon's uh, safety record. Well, well, I didn't ask about that. How about just the, let's look, could you just answer, because yes. we're going to run out of time. Could you just answer the question? Because I'm trying to help the Coast Guard here, and I'm trying to help the people of the United States and Alaska and everybody and say, we've got a professional agency. They, they know a lot about the ocean. They know a lot about the safety. And when they say it's not safe to sail, I'd just like to have a commitment from, I guess, your largest oil company in America. I don't know. Uh, one of the largest uh, in the world. Uh, that you, for one, uh, in dealing with your brethren, will say, you know, after the tragedy we suffered there, uh, even though that was a different thing, it wasn't because of weather conditions, we, for one, are going to support the Coast Guard whenever they make a port closure decision, and we ask you, our colleagues, to do the same so no one will get a competitive advantage out of this. When the Coast Guard asks us not to sail, we, won't, we don't sail. And you won't attempt to pressure back through the administration, because I've heard this is the second time I've heard of this. This happened last year before the Exxon Valdez spill, that people were pressured, that the Coast Guard got a call from the big boss up there, I guess DOT, maybe we should put him under the Pentagon because it would probably take him a few more days to call him, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that they, had to, uh, they had to open it up again. I don't understand that. Well, I, so, it's happened. I mean, uh, uh, the Admiral just told us understand. it happened again this year. Yeah, I, I don't understand the okay, reasons so, for so that Exxon for why one, it would happen. And, right. So Exxon, so, for one, will be, will be standing there next to the Admiral or the Captain who's ever delegated that authority and saying, we agree and we wish our competitors would uh, follow the same policy. When we're told that it's unsafe to sail and don't sail, we Well, I know, but I'd still yes. like, I, I know <laughs> also that uh, you have some influence in the administration. I'd just like to know that a phone call won't go to uh, the Secretary of Transportation, Mr. Skinner, saying, hey, uh, we can't sail because we're obeying what the Coast Guard said, but uh, we wish that you get the Coast Guard to back off here because we really want to sail. I'd just like to have that assurance. Well, I don't understand those, those actions there that have been taken place. <laughs> well, you understand them. Place. Someone, so. maybe someone who gave a lot of money to the committee to elect the president, called up someone in the administration and said, hey, we're losing profits. We want to sail. We don't care about volcanoes. We don't care about what's happening out there. You know, uh, we want to sail. We can't slow down the uh, pipeline. The of the company that just spent two billion dollars on an accident. Would you expect us to 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 want to sail in an environment where the Coast Guard says that it's not safe to sail? Well, you, you haven't you haven't spent the fifty eight. We're not going to do that. You haven't. We're spent going the, to abide by what the Coast Guard says. I, I but I guess I don't see those. I mean, I, you haven't spent the fifty eight point five. I think the the that uh, um, you know that uh, Mr. Uh, God, I'm getting mixed up on my names here, Mr. Parker. Uh, I mean, he's laid out a great plan for us here, and I wish that the industry could pony up the money to pay for it. Uh, you know, a 58.5 million, gosh, I think that's a bargain. I mean, if you prevent one oil spill, you're self-insured, I assume, for the most part. Uh, you know, I mean, you could uh, carry considerably less reserves, or I guess you took it mostly out of profits, maybe it didn't come out of reserves. Uh, but, uh, boy, that would be something to sell to your stockholders. There's never going to be uh, this kind of liability again, because we just spent $58.5 million, great investment or your share. Yeah, I'm not saying you should pay the whole thing because you're only one of the partners. Well, I think uh, the industry's made some improvements, working with the state in Prince William Sound that we've already reviewed. In addition to that, we've got the PRO organization and there are some steps being taken there. I understand that they're looking at a budget that's like $145 million plus a $65 million per year uh, uh, expenditure to maintain the PRO organization. That's going to substantially improve the capability to respond well, to these I hope a year from today we hear that Mr. Parker's concerns of Mr. Parker, would you like to? Uh, <laughs> Mr. You, you, you've been Mr. waiting Chairman, quite a few years for that, I understand. Yes. <laughs> you, uh, you've uh, laid it out uh, very Does, clearly. You think we'll be here next year congratulating uh, everybody on the completion of your, uh, your plan? That would be nice to believe. Well, let's hope. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Parker. Uh, 
chairman has uh, gone to vote, I think I better go to vote. Uh, I don't know if he had further. Huh? Okay. Uh, Mr. DeFazio? Yeah, yes. I had only one point I wanted to make What's to wrap that? up double hulls. The LNG people and the chemical people accepted double hulls 20 years ago as a necessary level of safety. And, you know, we've been asking for the same thing for crude oil ever since. And uh, there's just uh, no further reason for delay. So I'm just urging the Congress to hold tough where you are now. Thank you. I think that um, I'm going to, uh, I'm not, I, I realize you've been here a long time. I, I would hope that you could. Uh, He should be back within 10 minutes. Is that you can get down the hall to the men's room or something in the interim, have a coke? Uh, okay. So how about uh, it's subject to the call of the chair, but approximately uh, 10 minutes, and at that point he may he may be done. I don't know. We were having some kind of a vote on the flag, which is un obscure to me. So I've got to go find out about it. Thank you. Meeting will please come to order. This um, process was initiated by a third officer on the bridge uh, off Bly Reef. Uh, there's a third officer on the bridge here, too. Uh, while I was over on the floor, I talked with Congressman Miller, and he is uh, inextricably involved in an issue that he's going to have to resolve today. And rather than carry on this hearing, um, I think it's too important an issue uh, for us to go on without him being here. And what he will do, uh, the committee will submit questions to panel members uh, in writing uh, to be answered, and we will find another day in the near future. I, I particularly, being from Washington State and flying back and forth across this country, want to apologize to everybody from Alaska who came down here, and we will probably ask some of you to return. Um, but there is no way uh, at this point to do other than what I'm doing, and that is to put the uh, committee at recess until the call of the chairman. Uh, it's unclear what day it will be, but we will get to you as quickly as possible so that you'll have time to plan. And I, I especially want to not only um, report the uh, chairman's uh, apologies, but my own for uh, those of you who came so far and to be sent away. Thank you all very much. The record will remain open, uh, and so if there are further things people want to enter, please put them forward. We hope you will join us Sunday evening at 8 o'clock Eastern Time for Book Notes and a discussion this week with author James Aberesk. He has written a book entitled Advise and Dissent, Memoirs of South Dakota and the U.S. Senate. Now stay with us for a hearing on Aid to Panama and Nicaragua next. Capital. This is C-SPAN. We are taking a short break now to update our program schedule. And we also remind you that C-SPAN...